All right. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start um, shortly um, in like 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put, oh, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put a video on from Miss San. Um, I just want to share her, uh, her, her storytelling series because if she's making content on YouTube again well that uh yeah I think that's a big deal hello folks nice to see y'all um like I said I put it in the in the in the in the chat so let me go ahead and get this started and then we'll start reading right after اسمها تل عجول مدينة إلى كل متابعين القصص والحكايات في كل بقاع الأرض معكم حكواتية ومعنا حكاية جديدة رح نحكي فيها عن من وين ومتى أجد غزة حوالي سنة 3500 قبل الميلاد يعني من أكثر من 5000 سنة كان في مدينة كان عانية ساحلية اسمها تل عجول مدينة قوية وجميلة جدا وهاي المدينة حاليا موقعها هو شمال وادي غزة هاي المدينة كانت على علاقات قوية جدا مع المصريين لأنه فيها التجارة بتطلع البحر فيها مقر ومركز حتى لمرور القوافل العسكرية المصرية يعني ببساطة كانت قريبة من أنها تكون عاصمة الكنعانيين حتى كانت من أكبر المدن الكنعانية في أرض كنعان وأرض كنعان هي فلسطين والكنعانيين هم قبائل عربية أجوا من شبه الجزيرة العربية وهم أول من سكن فلسطين ولأنهم كانوا كثير شاطرين في التجارة والصناعة والزراعة أسسوا الحضارة الكنعانية الحضارة الكنعانية اللي كانت معروفة بركوب البحر بالعنب والتين والزتون والقمح كان يركبوا البحر ويستدلوا على المواقع من النجوم وحتى كان يساعدوا الجيران آه نقبوا على النحاس في شمال سيناء مع المصريين غير إنهم كانوا بناء للمدن وشاطرين كويس جدا في تحصينها ولكن للأسف الغزوات والحروب من سمات البشر الجشعة وكل حضارة وإلها وقت اضمحلال 
علشان هيك واحدة من المدن اللي سقطت من المدن الكنعانية هي تل عجول ولكن هالمدينة سلمت الرأي لمدينة تانية وفتحت الطريق لقيام واحدة من أهم المدن في التاريخ فبعد كم سنة من بداية الاضمحلال وعلى تل مش بعيد كثير يعني حوالي 20 كيلومتر في شمال مقر تل عجول على حوالي مساحة كيلومتر مربع رح تقوم مدينتنا الحبيبة غزة هاي المدينة اللي رح تبدأ من حي الزيتون حوالي 1600 قبل الميلاد ورح تنتشر وتتوسع في كل مداء في كل مكان مدينة ساحلية قوية ثرية غنية خضراء المدينة هاي كمان كانت مركز لتجارة التوابل ومركز لتجارة ما بين الشرق والغرب والغرب والشرق بالإضافة لأنه بعد حوالي 3500 سنة في أيامنا الحالية رح نكتشف إنها كمان غنية بالغاز والغاز رح يكون لعنتها الأبدية ظهور غزة خلى مدن تانية تظهر زي مثلا رفح رفح اللي كانت بوابة آسيا لأفريقيا رفح اللي كان عندها علاقات مميزة جدا مع المصريين وحتى مدن تانية لها ثقلها التاريخي والثقافي والاجتماعي زي دير البلح وخان يونس في السنوات اللي تلت قيام غزة قبل ما نتحرك من هاي الحقبة الزمنية ولأنه صعب نحكي عن التاريخ وندرسه بدون ما نحكي عن الناس اللي كانت فيه فبدي أحكي لكم أنه حوالي سنة 1850 قبل الميلاد يا عمو برفيق أنبياء من العراق لوين؟ لفلسطين لأرض كنعان واللي هيجوا من بعده بعد مئات السنين يوشع بن نون وداود وسليمان وموسى ويحيى وزكريا وعيسى عليهم السلام سيدنا إبراهيم أجا علشان يدعو لديانة التوحيد في أرض كنعان بس أرض كنعان كانت تعبد عدة آلهة ولا مرة كانت فاضية كان في قبائل عربية ساكنة في هاي الأرض إحنا حكينا عن غزة كثير بس غزة مدينة من 119 مدينة كنعانية كان في مدن كثير خاصة على روافد وادي غزة يعني المنطقة ما بين الخليل وغزة كانت مليئة بمدن تانية على شاكلة تل عجول وعلى شاكلة مدينة غزة ولكن هاي المدينة بسبب انهيار مدن كتير صارت هي العاصمة الإقليمية للكنعانيين وصارت مركز إداري وعسكري للمصريين وصارت مشرفة على طريق التجارة والطرق العسكرية اللي بتودع الشمال على العراق على الأناضول على الشام وعلى الفينيقيين في ما يسمى لبنان الآن ولكن بعد سنة 1200 قبل الميلاد رح نلاقي أنه التواجد مش بس هيكون كنعاني ومصري في منطقة غزة هتيجي قبائل اسمها قبائل البالستا هتيجي من الجزر اليونانية وهتسكن في عد معي عسقلان، عاقر، دود، عراق المنشية وحبيبتنا غزة هاي القبائل رح تكون نواة التطور الحضاري والتكنولوجي والمعرفي في مجال تخزين الحبوب والزراعة في مجال صناعة الأدوات والأسلحة والأدوات الزراعية من الحديد للمرة الأولى وهم مجال في مجال التجارة لما وراء البحر من أرض كنعان كمان للمرة الأولى وبهيك بيكون في عنا تواجد كنعاني عربي في منطقة الجبال أو وسط وبعض من شرق أرض كنعان اللي هي فلسطين وتواجد فلسطيني في هاي الساحل الغربي الجنوبي لا أرض كنعان أو فلسطين وعلى فكرة هذا التواجد الفلسطيني الكنعاني كان منسجم فمن ناحية عنا الكنعانيين اللي بيزرعوا واللي بيبنوا مدن وأول ناس أجوا على الأرض ومن ناحية عنا تواجد فلسطيني كنعاني بيحمي ظهر البلاد من غزاة البحر وبيصنع وبتاجر فالتواجد الفلسطيني والكنعاني أدى لأن يصير في عنا شعب فلسطيني كنعاني عربي يسكن فلسطين وأرض كنعان هذا الشعب اتدين بنفس الديانات وحكى نفس اللغات بشكل منسجم جدا لغاية بداية الأطماع الصهيونية في الأرض والثروات قبل 200 سنة سنة 1186 قبل الميلاد تسللت قبائل العبرانية للمرة الأولى على فلسطين أو أرض كنعان هاي القبائل العبرانية أجت من ناحية الأغوار يعني من شرق فلسطين وكانت بقيادة يوشع بن نون هاي القبائل آثرت إنها تنعزل وتبعد عن المدن الكنعانية المزدحمة مين رح يجي يحكي لصاحب الأرض شاركني بأرضك أو على الأقل هي كانت الدنيا في هذاك الوقت فضلت بعيدة عن كل الزحمة هاي القبائل العبرانية ومنعزلة ولكن الأطماع في إنها 
تسلب الأرض وتحرق الزرع وتقتل السكان خلتها تستوطن وتسكن وتستقر في بعض المدن الكنعانية في الجبال في وسط فلسطين في خاصرة فلسطين زي ما حكينا ولكن لحد هاي اللحظة اللي بنحكي فيها ما كانت هاي القبائل العبرانية تجرؤ على أنها تقترب من الساحل الغربي اللي كان فيه فلسطينيين كانوا يحكوا عنهم جبارين كانوا أهل معركة كانوا أهل حرب وما كانوا بيهزموا واحد هاي أحد أهم هاي المدن اللي كانت عاصمة الفلسطينيين مين؟ حد يحذر؟ غزة العبرانيين ما كانوا بس في بينهم وبين الكنعانيين معارك أو بينهم وبين السكان الأصليين في أرض كنعان كمان بينهم وما بين بني عمون بني عمون اللي كانوا بسكنوا الشرق أرض كنعان واللي هي الأردن حاليا وعلى هذا الحال من القتال سكنت قبائل عبرانية وقبائل عربية أرض فلسطين سنة 1010 قبل الميلاد برضو يا نغم سنة 1010 قبل الميلاد تولى سيدنا داود الحكم في هاي القبائل العبرانية ولكن لحد هذيك اللحظة ما كانت بتقدر القبائل العبرانية إنها تسيطر على أي مدينة فلسطينية في الغرب حتى بالأمارة مرة من المرات حاولوا يقتربوا من طريق التجارة الفينيقي الفلسطيني المصري في منطقة وسط وغرب فلسطين ولكن تحول هذا الاقتراب لمعركة اسمها معركة أفيق وانتصروا فيها الفلسطينيين كما ورد في التوراة في سفر سموئيل الأول ولكن على كل حال بعد هيك اتوالت الاحتلالات على سكان الأرض بكل قبائلها الاحتلال الأشوري والسامري والفارسي واليوناني والبيزنطي ما ضلش حد اللي احتل أرض فلسطين ما هو بالنهاية وكمان توالت الدعوات لديانات سماوية لليهودية والمسيحية والمسلمة لحد وصول فلسطين للعهد الإسلامي ولكن بكل هاي الأوقات كانوا شعب فلسطين منسجمين ومتسامحين بيحكوا اللغة العربية كانوا متسامحين يهودا ومسلمين ومسيحيين بالرغم من طريقة الاحتلال وطريقة بداية هذا الانسجام ولكن لحد بداية الأطماع الصهيونية فلسطين كانت متسامحة كانت أرض فيها خير فيها سكان عرب بكل الأديان والآن في آذار 2024 الشهر السادس من الإبادة الجماعية اللي بتتعرض لها غزة بكل سكانها بدي أحكي لكم أن غزة فلسطينية عربية لا يملك فيها الاحتلال سوى أطماعه وخيباته التاريخية وطمعه في الثروات والأرض ولا يملك أحد في غزة سوى سكان غزة وقراها وباقي السكان الفلسطينيين اللي لجأوا إلى غزة من باقي القرى والمدن اللي تم إرهابها وتحجيرها سنة 1948 على إيد العصابات الصهيونية من وين أنت يا عم أبو رفيق؟ من وين أنت؟ حمام من حمام عم أبو رفيق من حمامة وكذلك 60% من سكان قطاع غزة من باقي المدن والقرى الفلسطينية اللي تهجرت بسنة 1948 هاي المدينة الغالية اللي اسمها غزة وأنا ما بحكي عن قطاع غزة بحكي عن الحي الصغير اللي بدأ من الزيتون وكبر لوصل لحد قرى تانية محيطة في غزة أو قضاء غزة زي السوافير وهربيا والفلوجة ولكن حتى مصطلح قطاع غزة هو مصطلح عسكري عمره فقط من عمر الاحتلال غزة أوسع كمان من الأرض اللي إحنا موجودين عليها حالياً يحكي لكم أنه هاي المدينة هي مربط الفرس وأهم البدايات رح أكمل لكم قصتها في الحلقات الجاية All right. Hope uh, hope y'all uh, enjoyed that. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so um, first things first. Before anyone asks, um, this is uh, my cat clawed me, um, and my cat that has not had his nails clipped in like he hadn't had his nails clipped in like two weeks. So uh, yeah, that is that is why this. Um, I didn't, like, cut myself shaving or anything like that. Um, yes, so, um, hello, Courtney. Glad you could come. All right. So, 
so. All right. This is day four of our um, my uh, Crime Think reading fundraiser thing. Um, we're going to continue reading Days of War, Nights of Love. Um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do that. Um, but first, right quick, uh, let me get, give people, uh, more people a chance to, um, to, to show up and get comfy. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a book, um, also by, also by Crime Think, um, Contradictionary, um, a compendium of conundrums, aphorisms, and aperçus, a glossary of capitalist Kant and anarchist argot, a lexicon for the lawless. From abstraction to praxis, from youthful or phobia to entelechy, this tiny tome elucidates why the hostis humani generis must epite la bourgeoisie and what etymology can tell us about democracy, a must for the partisan of Parisia, a crime think curio. I'm going to read some of the, just some definitions of this, just because it's fun, uh, funny. Um, someone give me a, give me a number, random number between 10 and 314, and we'll read from that page. Hello, Alice, Amity. Glad you could make it. Okay. I generated a random number. It's 67. Oh, no, 120. Let's do 120. Let's do 67 and then 120. Okay. Freegan. In the 1940s, needing a term to designate complete abstention from animal products, Donald Watson gutted vegetarian to coin the word vegan. In the 1990s, anti-capitalists suspicious of the expanding market for cruelty-free commodities adjusted this neologism to freegan to describe the total avoidance of exchange economics. But in a world dominated by capitalism, many other marketplaces loom beyond the marketplace proper. The marketplace of ideas, for example, in which some self-professed freegans decide they should sell the idea of not buying things. A decade later, freeganism has been covered in dozens of newspapers, radio shows, fashion magazines, and television programs. Of course, in order to fit the story into the narrative of the corporate media, it was necessary to emphasize that freegans were neither homeless nor destitute. Freeganism was a political statement, a canny improvement on bargain hunting, or simply another lifestyle preference, but in any case, nothing that would discomfort bourgeois viewers. No desperate expressions of need here. As it turns out, even garbage is granted legitimacy and value sooner than the people thrown away by the capitalist system. We can imagine an officer of the NYPD having watched one of these instructive news programs, accosting a homeless person rummaging in a trash can. Hey, get out of there, you. Don't you know there are nice college students who depend on that for food? Friendly fire. War is so cuddly these days. See smart bomb. Gallows humor. Revolutionary, facing the guillotine. We die because the people are asleep. You will die because they will awaken. Executioner. Don't put all your heads in one basket. Garbage. Everything, sub everything subtracted from the present is added to the future with interest. Yeah. Fun little book. Um, for page 66. Uh, uh, debate. Debate. An opportunity for mutual gain often mistaken for a competition to everyone's misfortune. As in economics, those who set out to win doom all to losing. Nothing is more precious to someone who wishes to sharpen her analysis and expand her perspective than an intelligent person who disagrees with her. A rhetorician can dominate an argument. A bore can win the field by attrition. An ideologue can stop up his ears and perhaps also the brains of everyone in earshot. 
But if you wish to converse rather than compete, you have to shoulder the burden of helping your interlocutor make her argument as well. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's get, let's get into it. we leave off oh, I <clears throat> oh god excuse me I is for identity, identity, ideology, and image. Us versus them, the eternal myth and paradox. Adapted from Stella Nera's journals. One, identity and the scarcity economics of self. After we met Alec, Jackson remarked, when I meet a person, I don't like it if he immediately starts talking shit about other people. I don't want to hear about which groups he is against, but what he is doing, himself. Well, Jackson, well, Jackson, I think in his own crippled way, Alex was trying to tell you what he was doing. What he's doing is... <clears throat> Sorry, Al. Well, Jackson, I think in his own crippled way, Alex was trying to tell you what he's doing. What he's doing is simply being against the cliques he was talking about. Perhaps he has no notion of how to do anything more positive than to take an opposing stance. He's certainly not the only one. Competitive human relations depend on and perpetuate a feeling of impoverishment in the individual, a scarcity economics of the soul, for in the status quo she is unable to do what she wants, and at the same time she must feel this helplessness and poverty of life to be willing to play instead the loser's game of power. To assuage this feeling of impoverishment, the individual seeks, more than mere physical possessions, which are just means to this end, identity, the, con the consolation for identity, the consolation for lack of freedom. If I can't, at least I am. Identity as a concept works in terms of contrast. One is a fill in the blank, as opposed to the others who are not. Thus, to the desperate lost soul of modern society, nothing is more precious than opponents, people to despise, so he can reassure himself of his own worth. As a faithful, pa as a faithful patron of brand X ideology, for example, the young activist, though heretofore unaware of it, has quite a stake in maintaining the alienation of others, and it should not be surprising when he acts superior, threatening, etc., in order to maintain the distance between himself and the normal people. To be effective at acting, to be effective at acting radically, rather than just acting radical, one must be disinterested in being radical, or an activist, but only desire to help make radical things happen. So no more stupid conflicts and infighting, for heaven's sake. In a system which is conflict systemat in a system which is conflict systematized as social relations, in which society is a network of struggles arranged as a social structure, in which society is a network of struggles arranged as social structure, getting along is practically the definition of the radical act. Until we are able to leave our identities behind, whenever, whenever we come together, it will be merely a case of images meeting and clashing, with the humans behind them unable to even see each other. Two, fight war and wars. This being the case, we can't spend all our energy on our efforts simply to defeat the state, corporate tyranny, etc. For even if we do succeed, as long as most people are unable to work together, and thus unaware of their own potential, the struggle with the state is just another power struggle substitute for free action. <clears throat> we, 
We need to strive simultaneously for freedom from external constraints and for the strength to love and forgive and cooperate. And for this project, we absolutely must be ready to shake off our need for identity in the traditional sense. What we need most now are ways to speak that can give others voices of their own. Contrary to the aforementioned social contrary to the aforementioned social scarcity economics, in which the very act of speaking monopolizes expression and denies it to others. Ways, that act, ways to act that can activate. These will be the weapons no power can defeat. What is needed above all, then, is the self-confidence to talk with and listen to others, to find magic tricks by which old conflicts can be superseded and people like Alec and his rival factions discover ways to coexist and support each other. For revolution is not making everyone the same in their ideologies or relations with each other, but simply establishing mutually beneficial relationships between different individuals and groups. I would, do better my, I would do better myself to think about how Alec and I can transcend our predictable interactions instead of just analyzing him in a way that makes me feel so much smarter and more mature. Do you have ideas, or do ideas have you? Quote, the ideologist is a man who falls for the fraud perpetuated on him. Mm. Quote, the ideologist is a man who falls for the fraud perpetrated on him by his own intellect. That an idea, i.e. the symbol of a momentarily perceived reality, can possess absolute reality. Socrates, refusing, Socrates, refuting Plato's interpretation of his ideas. Quote, I am not a Marxist. Karl Groucho Marx. Quote, the world eludes us because it becomes itself again. The world eludes us because it becomes itself again. Lewis Carroll. Editor's introduction. Possibly the best text any of us have written on this subject is a letter Nadia once sent to a friend in response to an article he had written with her help. Her original title for the piece had been The Political Struggle is the Struggle Against the Political, which he changed to Against the Shallowness of the Political. So here is her letter reprinted from his private collection. Remember, whatever you believe imprisons you. June 2nd, Amsterdam, at Chloe's with Phoebe and Heloise. Dearest E, no, you haven't understood what I'm talking about at all. In your hurry to purchase for yourself the image of political activist, or worse, theorist, whatever that is, <clears throat> whatever that is, you've concluded that everything must be political, whatever that is. For the farther you expand the meaning of any word, the blurrier it becomes, and the more useless. Once everything is political, then political means nothing all over again, and we have to start from scratch. So, assuming political isn't just a meaningless, all-purpose word, of course there are political ways to look at every issue, including one's own mortality. I wasn't trying to deny that. That, in fact, is exactly my point. Once you begin to think of yourself as political, once you start to think in terms of analysis and critique, worse yet to think of yourself as having a critique, you come to approach everything on those terms. You try to fit everything into your analysis. Being political becomes a cancer that slowly spreads to every corner of your being until you can't think about anything except in terms of class struggle or gender or whatever. And there is no analysis, no ideology, because that's what we're talking about here, with your insistence on the politics of living in the theory of politics, broad enough to capture everything that life is. An ideology, just like an image, is always something you have to purchase. That is, you must give up a part of yourself in return for it. That part of yourself is every aspect of the world, every deliciously complex experience, every, every irreducible detail that won't fit into the framework you've so proudly constructed. Sure, you can look at oral sex and sunsets and love songs and really good Chinese food in terms of political issues, or even approach them in a way that is political in a far less superficial sense. But the fact is that when you're there in those moments, there are things that escape any kind of comprehension, let alone expression, let alone analysis. 
Living and feeling are simply too complicated to be captured completely by any language, or any combination of languages. Just like that fucking half-wit Plato, the causality of ideology, which I'm begging you to not be, comes to doubt the reality of anything he can't symbolize with language, political or otherwise, because he's forgotten that his symbols are only convenient generalizations to stand in place of the innumerable unique moments that make up the universe. I can anticipate your response. My critique of the political is itself a political evaluation, a part of my ideology. And so it is. I write to you so vehemently about this because it's an issue I'm really struggling with now. I find myself turning everything into political tractor critique, possessed by what my ideology describes possessed by what my ideology describes as a capitalistic compulsion to transform all my feelings and experiences into objects, that is, into theories I can carry around with me. My values have come to revolve around these theories, which I show off as proof of my intelligence and importance, the same way a bourgeois man shows off his car as proof of his worth. My life isn't about my actual experience anymore, it's about the struggle. When I'd wanted that struggle to be about centering my life on my experiences, not some new substitute. I'd like to say this letter is my last stand against the all-consuming demands of the political, but that was probably long ago, the last time I was able to reflect on something without the political ramifications even occurring to me. Careful what you wish for, E, when you say everything... Careful what you wish for, E, when you say everything is political. I think part of this pathological need to systematize everything comes from living in cities, incidentally. Every single thing around us here has been made by human beings, and has specific human meanings attached to it. So when you look around, instead of seeing the actual objects that are around you, you see a forest of symbols. When I was staying in the mountains, it was different. I would go walking and I wouldn't see don't walk signs, I would see trees and flowers, things that have an existence beyond any framework of human meaning and values. Standing under a starry sky, there, gazing at the silent horizon, the world felt so immense and profound that I could only stand before it, mute and trembling. No politics could ever provide a vessel deep enough to hold these moments. Not to say there's no reason for us to conceptualize things, E, because of course that's useful sometimes, but it's a means, and not the only means, to a much greater end. That is all. I'll leave you with this, my own poor translation of a line from the farewell letter Mao Zedong's mistress wrote him shortly after the so-called success of the Chinese so-called communist revolution. Quote, It's sadly predictable that the only way you can come up with to celebrate the liberation you feel at leaving the old system behind is by coming up with a system of liberation, as if such a thing could exist. But that's what we can expect from those who have never known anything other than systems and systematizing, I guess. Yours with love, Nadia. Image. They hold you in the palm of their hand. Seduced by the image of reality. When I would look through magazines as a small child, I used to think there must be a magical world somewhere where everything looked and was perfect. I could see pictures from it in those pages, the smoky air of dimly lit rooms heavy with drama as the young models lounged in designer fashions. That is where excitement and, that is where excitement and adventure is to be found, I thought, in the world where every room is flawlessly decorated and every woman's wardrobe is picked and matched with daring and finesse. I resolved to have an advantageous life of my own, and began looking for those rooms and women right away. And though I've discovered since then that romance and excitement rarely come hand in hand with the images of them that are presented to us, usually the opposite is true, that adventure is to be found precisely where there is no time or energy for keeping up appearances. I still catch myself sometimes thinking that everything would be perfect if only I lived in that picturesque log cabin with matching rugs. Whatever each of us may be looking for, we all tend to pursue our desires by pursuing images, symbols of the things we desire. We buy leather jackets when we want rebellion and danger. We purchase fast cars not for the sake of driving at high velocities, but to recapture our lost youth. When we want to live in a different world, we buy political pamphlets and bumper stickers. Somehow we assume that having all the right accessories will get us the perfect lives. And as we construct our lives, we tend to do it according to an image, a pattern that has been laid out for us. Hippie, businessman, housewife, punk. Why do we... 
Why do we think so much about images today, rather than concentrating on reality, on our lives and emotions themselves? One of the reasons images have attained so much significance in this society is that, unlike activities, images are easy to sell. Advertising and marketing, which are designed to invest products with a symbolic value which will attract customers, have transformed our culture. Corporations have been spreading propaganda designed to make us believe in the magic powers of their commodities for generations now. Deodorant offers popularity, soda offers youth and energy, jeans offer sex appeal. At our jobs, we exchange our time, energy, and creativity for the ability to buy these symbols. And we keep buying them, for of course no quantity of cigarettes can really give anyone sophistication. Rather than satisfying our needs, these products multiply them. For to get them, we must sell our lives away. We keep going back, not knowing any other way, hoping that the new product, self-help books, punk rock records, that vacation cabin with matching rugs, will be the one that will fix everything. We are easily persuaded to chase these images because it is simply easier to change the scenery around you than it is to change your own life. How much less trouble, how much less risky it would be if you could make your life perfect just by collecting all the right accessories? No participation necessary. The image comes to embody all the things you desire, and you spend all of your time and energy trying to get the details right. The bohemian tries to find the perfect black beret and the right poetry readings to attend. The frat boy has to be seen with the right friends at the right parties, drinking the right beers and wearing the right informal dress shirts, rather than pursuing the desires themselves. For it is easier to identify yourself with a prefabricated image than to identify exactly what you want in life. But if you really want adventure, an Australian hunting jacket won't suffice. And if you want real romance, dinner and a movie with the most popular girl at your school might not be enough. Fascinated as we are by images, our values have come to revolve around a world we can never actually experience. There's no way into the pages of the magazine. There's no way to be the archetypal punk or the perfect executive. We're trapped out here in the real world. Forever. And yet we keep looking for life in pictures, in fashions, in spectacles of all kind, anything that we can collect or watch, instead of doing. We look for life in the image of life. Watching from the sidelines. The curious thing about a spectacle is how it immobilizes the spectators. Just like the image, it centers their attention, their values, and ultimately their lives around something outside of themselves. It keeps them occupied without making them active. It keeps them feeling involved without giving them control. You can probably think of a thousand different examples of this. Television programs, action movies, magazines that give updates on the lives of celebrities and superstars, spectator sports, representative democracy, the Catholic Church. A spectacle also isolates the people whose attention it commands. A spectacle also isolates the people whose attention it commands. Many of us know more about the fictitious characters of popular sitcoms than we know about the lives and loves of our neighbors. For even when we talk to them, it's about television shows, the news, and the weather. Thus the very experiences and information that we share in common as spectators of the mass media serve to separate us from one another. It is the same as a big football game. Everybody watching from the bleachers is a nobody, regardless of who they are. They may be sitting next to each other, but all eyes are focused on the field. If they speak to each other, it is almost never about each other, but about the game that is being played before them. <clears throat> And although football fans cannot participate in the events of the game they are watching, or exert any real influence over them, they attach the utmost importance to these events and associate their own needs and desires with the outcome in a most unusual way. Rather than concentrating their attention on things that have a real bearing on their desires, they reconstruct their desires to revolve around the things they pay attention to. <clears throat> their language even conflates the achievements of the team they identify themselves with to, with their own actions. Their language even conflates the achievements of the team they identify themselves with, with their own actions. We scored a goal. We won, shout the fans from their seats and sofas. This stands in stark contrast to the way people speak about the things that go on in our own cities and communities. They're building a new highway, we say, when we, they're building a new highway, we say about the new changes in our neighborhood. What will they think of next, we say about the latest advances, advances in scientific technology. What will they think of next? We say about the latest advantages, advances in scientific technology. Fuck. Our, langu our language reveals that we think of ourselves as spectators in our own societies. 
But it's not they, the mysterious other people, who have made the world the way it is. It is we, humanity ourselves. No small team of scientists, city planners, or rich bureaucrats could have done all the working and inventing and organizing that it's taken for us to transform this planet. It has taken and still takes all of us working together to do this. I just fucked up this whole paragraph, so let me, let me just... Let's see. This stands in stark contrast to the way people speak about the things that go on in our own cities and communities. They're building a new highway, we say about the new changes in our neighborhood. What will they think of next, we say about the latest advances in scientific technology. Our language reveals that we think of ourselves as spectators in our own societies. But it's not they, the mysterious other people, who have made the world the way it is. It is we, humanity ourselves. No small team of scientists, city planners, and rich bureaucrats could have done all the working and inventing and organizing that it has taken for us to transform this planet. It has taken and still takes all of us working together to do this. We are the ones doing it every day and yet most of us seem to feel that we can have more control over football games than we can over our cities our jobs even our own lives we might have more success in our pursuit of happiness if we start trying to really participate instead of accepting the role of passive spectator to sports society and life it is up to each of us to figure out how to play an active and significant part in creating the worlds around us and within us Perhaps one day we can build a new society in which we can all be involved together in the decisions that affect the lives we lead. Then we will be able to truly choose our own destinies. What's the point of doing anything if nobody's watching? We all want to be famous, to be seen, frozen, preserved in the media, because we've come to trust what is seen more than what is actually lived. Somehow we've gotten everything backwards and images seem more real to us than experiences. To know that we really exist, that we really matter, we have to see ghosts of ourselves preserved in photographs, on television shows, and videotapes, in the public eye. And when you go on vacation, what do you see? Scores of tourists with video cameras screwed to their faces, as if they're trying to suck all the real world into the two-dimensional world of images, spending their time off seeing the world through a tiny glass lens. Sure, turning everything that you could experience with all five senses into recorded information that you can only observe from a distance, detached, offers you the illusion of having control over your life. You can rewind and replay them, over and over, until everything looks ridiculous. But what kind of life is that? What's the point of watching anything if nobody's doing? my immediate thought is uh, from Lucille is uh, ignoring the joy of doing stuff with someone like anything you focus on is uh, focus on is spectacular as such is a distraction yeah yeah basically basically we need to we need to focus on action and doing not because when, when when we invest ourselves in emotionally and psychologically in images and symbols and signifiers, then we become more alienated from our own lives. Um, and I mean, to some degree, I'm doing this as well as as a, as a public figure. I am I am a an an icon, a an image on a screen. Like you know, y y you don't know me. Um, uh, you don't, I mean, you, you don't really know me the way that, y'all don't really know me as a human being, um, you know me as a, a creative, which does mean you have a lot of insight into, like, into me and how I think and my life and shit like that, just because I'm very open about it, but, but I'm not, you don't know me as a human being, the way you know the people in your actual life. Um, and they are the ones that matter. 
like does the book define spectacle earlier i think that's where my confusion is spectacle is is the uh anything that we imbue with the power that to be like hey pay attention pay attention to this like spectacle can be made out of uh, basically anything. We've done a really good job of making spectacle out of basically everything. Um, if you haven't seen Nope by Jordan Peele um, from the other year, um, uh, that's a really good film like about spe the idea of spectacle. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a good one too. Actually, you know what? Spectacle is probably a word in here. Let's see. Okay, no, not in there. That's okay. We only see a snapshot of you, what you want us to see, right? Exactly. Like, like most of my time is spent, most of my time is spent sitting in front of a computer editing and stuff. Um, like, you don't see the part, you only see a very, very narrow, um, carefully curated version of of what i want you to see of the the the, the performance that i'm because i am performing self for y'all um it's like it, it is it is it is me it, it is like my my true self you know true self but um but i just like you and everyone else is um you're so much more than what the world like sees uh the in the way you way you present the for example social media is a good example of this um if you are on social media you have an image a simulacrum in a signifier in in the the, the cyberspace and the way that you put your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences and such, the way you record that into social media and share that with the world to see, um, <clears throat> to witness, not actually experience, um, is there's two versions of yourself. It, it, it's, it's a version of yourself that you're, you, you've constructed, um, you you know whatever reputation if you if you're like a shit poster like like that's that's the that's the kind of personality um public persona that you've you've you know you've made like you don't have to be <clears throat> you don't have to be famous to um or have a giant audience to to have a a simulated image of yourself um because yeah there are no images that can there are no images that can um, encapsulate who we are because, like, again, these streams are probably, like, the most that y'all, you know, can get from me at a single, in a single sitting, like, as a person um, because it's, you know, like, in real time um, and it's not edited and so you have all my... Um, my hesitation and uh, anxiety um, with performing, my uh, difficulty speaking sometimes, tripping over my words and, and such, and having difficulty like phrasing things, um, like that's that that's all the stuff that you know. That's all the stuff that doesn't isn't in my uh, videos. The ones I've scripted and edited edited together. Um, because really what we are is what we spend our time doing. Most of us, um, 
I mean, it's what think think of how you spend your time. Think about your direct lived experience of life. What do you spend most of your time doing? Participating um, or just witnessing, watching, consuming? Um, yeah. Uh, Lucille is like, uh, would me playing a board game with my friends be spectacle? Or is it something larger that is truly out of my control and irrelevant? See, the board game itself is irrelevant you know the board game itself is irrelevant um it's what it is is the time spent with your friends that's what matters whether you're playing a board game together a board game that is definitely branded and mass produced um and probably varying shades of problematic or created by problematic people or or s something it's the game itself is a product just like a, a film a television show anything else you can like ex you know experience with other people and share with other people like that um but uh, th the important thing is the time the time you spend with with the with people like there there's no problem with um people having you know bonding over common interests that are you know rooted in like pop culture or art or media or something the problem is when when we start to uh glorify and venerate the symbols and the brands and the products over our time and experience with other people like because the only thing that matters and i've said this multiple times just throughout everything the only thing that matters is people is other people and you know i think most of us can probably agree that whatever your the the great uh But calling the board game irrelevant feels like it's leaving out the story. The medium with which time is spent. Ooh, one sec. Oh. Uh, but calling the board game irrelevant feels like it's leaving out the story. The medium with which time is spent with people still matters and allows you to get to know others more closely. Yeah, yeah, that's that that's true, but. But the problem with it, it, it doesn't matter on a like whatever it's about. I, I say like whatever it's about is in a grand in the grand scheme of things irrelevant. It is it is merely the it is merely a medium. Um, Um, it is a medium through which, uh, we can interact with other people. I just struggle to talk unless I'm doing something with someone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's, and, like, I, I, I'm like that, I'm like that too. Um, like, I, I, I don't like small talk. <laughs> um, I, I don't like, uh, yeah. I don't like small talk. I'm, I mean, I'm decent at it, but I hate it. Uh, but yeah, no, like you know, we 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 can bond over things, products, in products and commodities. Like we can bond over them, but just keeping in mind, prioritize the experience with the people, with the other people, instead of the product itself. Because we make an we make idols out of them. Um, go watch my Oscars video um, where I you know talk more about that. Because it's a uh, yeah I talk about that at length. I start to be better at it because I'm terrified. Everybody's 
everybody's terrified. Um, we're all we're all terrified of everyone else because that's how we've been that's how we've been raised um, and conditioned. So don't worry don't worry about it. Generally, the same thing with animals out in the wild. Um, if you if you like encounter them um they're more likely they're more scared of you than you are of them and with i found that with most other human beings that we're not like you know close to um that we're not incredibly close to that is kind of you know this is kind of you know how it goes other people are just as scared if not more scared of of you so um it's a helpful thing to, to to keep in mind at least it has been for me um all right continuing on oh i hope the, the small discussions uh in between essays if uh if that's something y'all uh you know would enjoy because i know it helps, it helps to talk about things and process. L is for love. Join the resistance. Fall in love. Falling in love is the ultimate act of revolution, of resistance to today's tedious, socially restrictive, culturally constrictive, patently ridiculous world. Love transforms the world. Where the lover formerly felt boredom, he now feels passion. Where she once was complacent, she now is excited and compelled to self-asserting action. The world which once seemed empty and tiresome becomes filled with meaning, filled with risks and rewards, with majesty and danger. Life for the lover is a gift, an adventure with the highest possible stakes. Every moment is memorable, heartbreaking in its fleeting beauty. When they fall in love, a person who was once disoriented, alienated, and confused finally knows exactly what they want. Suddenly, their existence makes sense to them. It becomes valuable, even glorious and noble. Burning passion is an antidote that will cure the worst cases of despair and resignation. Love makes it possible for individuals to connect to others in a meaningful way. It impels them to leave their shells and risk being honest and spontaneous together, to come to know each other in profound ways. Thus, love makes it possible for us to care about each other genuinely, rather than at the end of the gun of Christian doctrine. But at the same time, it plucks the lover out of the routines of everyday life and separates her from other human beings. She feels a million miles away from the herd of humanity, living as she is in a world entirely different from theirs. In this sense, love is subversive, because it poses a threat to the established order of our modern lives. The boring rituals of workday productivity and socialized etiquette no longer mean anything to a man who has fallen in love, and for there are more important forces guiding him than mere inertia and deference to tradition. Marketing strategies that depend upon apathy or insecurity have no effect upon him. Entertainment designed for passive consumption, which depends upon exhaustion or cynicism, can no longer interest him. There is no place for the passionate, romantic lover in today's world, business or private, for he can see that it might be more worthwhile to hitchhike to Alaska or sit in the park and watch the clouds sail by with his sweetheart than to study for his calculus exam or sell real estate. And if he decides that it is, he will have the courage to do it rather than be tormented by unsatisfied longing. He knows that breaking into a cemetery and making love under the stars will make for a more memorable night than watching television ever could. So love poses a threat to our consumer-driven economy, which depends upon consumption of largely useless products and the labor that this consumption necessitates to perpetuate itself. Similarly, love poses a threat to our political system, for it is difficult to convince a man who has a lot to live for in his personal relationships to be willing to fight and die for an abstraction like the state. For that matter, it may be difficult to convince him to even pay taxes. It poses a threat to cultures of all kind, for when human beings are given wisdom and valor by true love, they will not be held back by traditions or customs which are irrelevant to the feelings that guide them. Love even poses a th Love even poses a threat to our society itself. Passionate love is ignored and feared by the bourgeoisie, for it poses a great danger to the stability and pretense they covet. Love permits no lies, no falsehoods, 
not even any polite half-truths, but lays all emotions bare and reveals secrets which domesticated men and women cannot bear. You cannot lie with your emotional you cannot lie with your emotional and sexual response. Situations or ideas excite or repel you, whether you like it or not, whether it is polite or not, whether it is advisable or not. One cannot be a lover and a dreadfully responsible, dreadfully respectable member of today's society at the same time. For love impels you to do things which are not responsible or respectable. True love is irresponsible, irrepressible, rebellious, scornful of cowardice, dangerous to the lover and everyone around her, for it serves one master alone, the passion that makes the heart beat faster. It disdains everything else, be it self-preservation, duty, or shame. Love urges men and women to heroism and to anti-heroism, to indefensible acts that need no defense for the one who loves. For the lover speaks a different moral and emotional language than the typical bourgeois man does. The average bourgeois man has no overwhelming, smoldering desires. Sadly, all he knows is the silent despair that comes of spending his life pursuing goals set for him by his family, his educators, his employers, his nation, and his culture, without ever being able to consider what needs and wants he might have of his own. Without the burning fire of desire to guide him, he has no criteria upon which to choose what is right and wrong for himself. Consequently, he is forced to adopt some dogma or doctrine to direct him through his life. There are a wide variety of moralities to choose from in the marketplace of ideas, but which are mora- oh, Excuse me. Thank you, Luciel. Am I saying that right? I hope I'm saying that right. There are a wide variety of moralities to choose from in the marketplace of ideas, but which morality a man buys into is immaterial, so long as he chooses one because he is at a loss otherwise as to what he should do with himself and his life. How many men and women, having never realized that they had the option to choose their own destinies, wander through life in a dull haze, thinking and acting in accordance with the laws that have been taught to them, merely because they no longer have any idea what to do? But the lover needs no prefabricated principles to direct her. Her desires identify what is right and wrong for her, for her heart guides her through life. She sees beauty and meaning in the world because her desire paints the world in these colors. She has no need for dogmas, for moral systems, for commandments and imperatives, for she knows what to do without instructions. Thus she does indeed pose quite a threat to our society. What if everyone decided right and wrong for themselves without any regard for conventional morality? What if everyone did whatever they wanted to, with the courage to face any consequences? What if everyone feared loveless, lifeless monotony more than they fear taking risks, more than they fear being hungry or cold or in danger? What if everyone set down their responsibilities and common sense and dared to pursue their wildest dreams, to set the stakes high and live each, li live each day as if it were the last? Think of what a place the world could be. Certainly it would be different than it is now, and it is quite a truism that people from the mainstream, the simultaneous keepers and victims of the status quo, fear change. And so, despite the stereotype images used in the media to sell toothpaste and honeymoon sweets, genuine passionate love is discouraged in our culture. Being carried away by your emotions is frowned upon. Instead, we are raised to always be on our guard, lest our hearts lead us astray. Rather than being encouraged to have the courage to face the consequences of risks taken in pursuit of our heart's desires, we are counseled not to take risks at all, to be responsible. And love itself is regulated. Men must not fall in love with other men, nor women with other women, nor individuals from different ethnic backgrounds with each other, or else the usual bigots who form the frontline offensive in the assault of modern Western culture upon the individual will step in. Men and women who have already entered into a legal or religious contract are not to fall in love with anyone else, even if they no longer feel any passion for their marital partners. Love as most of us know it today is a carefully prescribed and preordained ritual, something that happens on Friday nights in expensive movie theaters and restaurants, something that fills the pockets of the shareholders and the entertainment industries without preventing workers from showing up to office on time and ready to reroute phone calls all day long. This regulated commercial love is nothing like the burning fire that consumes the genuine lover. For love is a wildflower that can never grow within the confines prepared for it, but only appears where it is least expected. 
<clears throat> All right. We must fight against these cultural restraints that would cripple and smother our desires. For it is love that gives meaning to life, desire that makes it possible for us to make sense of our existence and find purpose in our lives. Without these, there is no way for us to determine how to live our lives, except, except to submit to some authority, to some god, master, or doctrine that will tell us what to do and how to do it without ever giving us the satisfaction that self-determination does. So, fall in love today. <clears throat> Frog in my throat. So fall in love today with men, with women, with music, with ambition, with yourself, with life. Quote, I am a true adorer of life, and if I can't reach the face of it, I plant my kisses somewhere further down. Andreas Bader. One might say that it is ridiculous to implore others to fall in love. One either falls in love or one does not. It is not a choice that can be made consciously. Emotions do not follow the instructions of the rational mind. But the environment in which we must live out our lives has a great influence on our emotions, and we can make decisions that affect this environment. It should be possible to work to change an environment that is hostile to love into an environment that encourages it. Our task must be to engineer our world so that it is a world in which people can and do fall in love, and thus to reconstitute human beings so that we will be ready for the revolution spoken of in these pages, so that we will be able to find meaning and happiness in our lives. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, typically go by Lucy. Nice. I think I need to read this book. You should. And and like again, there there are so many like <clears throat> illustrations, little like you know like just comics and stuff that don't really like they can't really like read aloud. Um, yeah, th th these are very. There is a lot to be gained from having like the actual like text. Um, so, yes, I do recommend, um, if you're able to. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Basically, <clears throat> love being... Thinking of love as the thing that... Um, Yeah, yeah. Illustrations are nice. I always loved picture books. Um, but, uh, yeah. Important thing about, important thing about love and desire, because much of what anarchy and anarchism is about is about people getting what they want people living how they want to live are or we are we're complex contradictory wild beings whose who, whose brains are uh dysfunctional uh, machines that have little rhyme or reason and just do weird do weird things want weird things feel compelled to do weird things um that are just outside of our control and <clears throat> and when it comes to our desires and what we want out of life because in in anarchism the highest the most valuable thing in the world is human happiness nothing really matters besides human happiness um what that poem describes is how i'm trying to write new poetry transfer i'm glad i'm glad to hear um okay so yes, our our um our desires are not orderly. They're not neat. They're 
strange and strange and wild and constantly in flux and our desires are what lay the groundwork for our happiness <clears throat> jesus christ our um yeah our our desires are what lay the foundation for what makes us happy because that's the thing about human happiness is it's it, 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 it like human happiness is uh it's attainable like human like so much of our media and art and culture seems to provide the message that happiness is is ultimately not possible um that you know wanting to live happy lives and want things and um be 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 healthy uh like that is possible it is possible for us to live in a way that <clears throat> it's possible for us to live in a way that prioritizes our our desires everybody everybody having their everybody's own desires everybody having the 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 freedom and and power to pursue and you know to pursue and uh you know to chase their desires and to in doing so live the kind of life they want to lead <laughs> i had a an ex who did not like the idea of uh human happiness being prioritized above all else because uh they consider it selfish um and which i mean it's not wrong it is it is selfish but guess what a little selfishness is not a bad thing like if you we're we're we're, we're un we're inherently narcissistic beings um human beings are that's just that's just how we're built it's it's the price we pay for the abilities of language and creating art and like it is the price for our complexity um is that we are inherently narcissistic beings um who or depend upon each other to survive we, we we only survive as a collective um as a community but we are all of us kind of trapped in our own in our own echo chamber of of self and that 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 struggle the struggle between those things is what drives desire for us we want to because because what do most of us when 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 people when people like uh like my ex um and people like them are are decry valuing human happiness as selfish and um you know judge so-called selfish behavior uh negatively um it's uh uh well, well one it's it, it's a it's a holdover from uh from christianity because that's the kind of central thing about christianity um is it is a religion of self-denial <laughs> it is a slave religion it insists that we stay miserable we embrace miserable existence now in hopes of future reward future reward like it's like oh yeah my life fucking sucks. I I I can't. I'm a good Christian, but <laughs> I'm a good Christian, but I am absolutely miserable. I'm enclosed by monogamy um and uh and and <clears throat> monogamy. I'm with, you know, like a, a partner who uh is not what I need or not not what I want 
or whatnot, but I've already, you know, made the commitment to them. And, you know, when you're, when you're married or, or whatnot, you can't, it's against the rules to, to, to go out to pursue desires elsewhere. And, and Christianity encourages that suffering, the present suffering, uh, in exchange for the hope of future reward of not suffering. Um, and, uh, but yeah, heaven doesn't exist. Um, folks, uh, heaven doesn't exist. All that we have, all that exists, all that matters is the here and now. Like if we don't focus on the here and now on, on, uh, enhancing and enhancing and enriching human life for everyone, right now then we're just wasting our time like what it what what is the point besides it and and a lot of uh a lot of you know thoughts thoughts along this are 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 when people think of selfish selfishness or um uh like look at ayn rand um randian self-interest um the way that the way that the capitalists and the fascists define self-interest it is a destructive and toxic thing it is uh to to act in one's own best interests i.e the things that will make them more successful under capitalism means to be ruthless to be to screw over and betray anyone that will that will you know gain you more capital um it is it is the 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 power structure that um allows the rich to exploit the poor um exploit rape colonize kill and and we, I think we, we incorrectly, because our system has conditioned us to think this way, we incorrectly point to selfishness as being uh, a motivating, you know, factor. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, okay, like, I like the idea in theory of every be everybody being able to do what they want to do their, fulfill their heart's desires. But what about the people who want to hurt people what about the people whose desires are to make life miserable for other people um and i mean see, see here's the thing most of us the reason that human beings are awful to each other is because we're incentivized to be it is because we are born and raised and conditioned by a system that pits everyone against all and isolates us and makes us uh randian ein randian pieces of shit um but but if we really think about it, what would what would be to the majority of humankind's benefit what would like make make what would make us happy um what would make the majority of human beings happy we're actually pretty easy to please most of us most of us do not derive pleasure from uh from hurting other people or or making other people miserable like don't don't you uh don't you rather like doesn't being good to and helping other people feel better and more like rewarding to you than being cruel to people and and hurting them like yeah yeah and yeah when when, when it comes to letting like selfishness motivate your actions like really the selfishness, the principle of self-love, selfishness is, like I said, it, it's a distraction. It is a 
a, a, a scapegoat, a target um, that distracts from what's really important, which is our desires. Our desires, our drives to happiness. That is what we need to follow. And that's another, that's another thing with like the Marquis de Sade for instance in his in his works what he what he said what you know he says is like his policy of like total freedom everybody should pursue what their what their heart desires and only only because of that they should only do because because of that because here's the thing if you're if you're a person i i think every human being should be able to have to 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 pursue their desires to live the way they want to live if if there are because so much of the, the miserable lives we lead are miserable because we don't want to live these kind of lives because we're not able to we're not able to create better for ourselves um but but yeah if 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 uh being altruistic just be honest with 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 ourselves because i i haven't oh my god i'm not gonna start talking about my fucking ex um especially not in uh no no can't sit there there are some things i cannot say about my um relationships with uh the people and my you know my personal life and whatnot because (laughs) yeah Um, something I figured out, something that, you know, anarchism helped me figure out, um, when I was actually, uh, on the younger side, when I was a teenager, is that selfishness and altruism, selfishness and selflessness is a false binary. They don't, they don't exist because we are in because we are such an interconnected species that is so dependent on each other to to make it to survive and thrive because of that our self-interest is tied is inextricably tied up uh our well-being is tied up in the well-being of others like for people to be happy the community needs to 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 function to work and even even the most even imagine the most like selfless individual ever who who does doesn't do any sort of who, who does like you know the, the activism gives always gives the the homeless people on the highways uh whatever a couple dollars um do all these acts of like charity and and altruism and but at the end of the day, you're still, even, even if, even if you're like, you know, just fundamentally trying to focus on other people and meeting their needs and filling their desires and whatnot, there's still a reason why you are doing that. You're doing it for the reward of being able to feel good about yourself because yeah, most of us, when we help, when we help people and, you know, help when we help people our brain makes the happy chemicals and it in it and it enriches our lives it it makes us feel and do better and i just think that's something we should cop to like there's nothing wrong with being creatures of desire who want what we want and uh, 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 like pursue and are, and are empowered to pursue what we want and to fulfill our desires. Um, there's nothing wrong with that because every it, because it's a universal condition. Want desire is a universal human condition. We all want things, even if we don't have even if we don't have like specific ideas of what we want, because most people. Uh, most people that I've met, at least, don't uh, have a real idea of what they like actually want. Um, but you know, even if we don't know, we we can't not want things, and that's just a part of being human that I think just we need to 
we need to admit to, we need to uh, accept. Um, like, I like to see what I'm doing here as uh, a service. I like to think that um, uh, my, not just, not just like reading and streaming, but also like just making videos and um, communicating my messages to the world, um, evangelizing if we're gonna be honest. Um, the way I frame that to myself most of the time is I'm trying to do some good for the world. I'm trying to put good things into the world. I'm trying to enrich other people's lives and help make the world a better place for everyone else. But at the same time, I can also admit, and I also have no problem admitting that I am I'm also doing this for selfish reasons. I like seeing my face on screen. I like seeing my 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 face. I like getting all prettied up and basically performing for an audience. I like that makes me feel good about myself and it makes and I like the importance that comes with it. The 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 attention of 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 internet micro celebrity. It's it's rewarding, you know, and, and you know, and I, and I can't deny that. It's not, like, that's not where, although that's not the only, that's not the primary reason why I do this, um, but it is a significant factor, and I'm not ashamed of that, and I think we, we shouldn't be ashamed of it, because <clears throat> even if I'm operating in, trying to operate in the interests of other people, and the rest of the world, I am also a part of that world, which means I am working for my benefit as well. And yeah, if, and when it comes to the, the darkest and most, uh, contra like problematic or most evil desires that crop up in our, our, our weird hearts and brains, because again, they're just, they're just valueless machines, um, and we live in a very violent world, so our desires are not, are very frequently not palatable and not, um, acceptable, and for myriad reasons. Um, but when it comes to the darkest, most evil desires that people have, if, if someone if somebody if somebody's true pursuit of happiness if their if their heart's desire is truly to be cruel and to hurt other people if that if that legitimately gives them pleasure and is gen genuinely something their heart desires i'd prefer if they were just if they just copped to it and and be like and just, you know, admit, it's like, yeah, this is, it's fucked up, but this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me feel fulfilled. I think there are very few people who are actually like that. But, he, but even if there are people like that, which, I mean, there are, I'd rather we just be honest, be honest with ourselves. Like, like we're, we're all fucked up messed up machines and we live in a very violent system that has fucked us up beyond recognition so yeah give give yourself grace and if you uh just getting out of a multi-day debilitating depression spell because uh not being selfish send me as far as for example could you appreciate yeah, yeah. To be able to love, love cannot be built on sacrifice. Love, love is not something that you should give up or sell part of yourself for. That is that as an expression of love. That that expression of love was invented by the people who want profit off of who seek to gain from you sacrificing your happiness. 
um, like Christianity, for instance. Um, that's you know kind of what their whole thing is. Yeah, they ben they benefit when you instead of uh, spending spending your money on a um, uh, to 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 have a, a a fun night with your with your family or to um, feed feed some of your neighbors who are uh, who can't afford groceries or something like that. Um, they would the church would have you would rather have you instead of being you know being selfish and you, you know, using your money f for um, using your time and money that way. The church benefits from you giving your money to them. So they teach you that sacrifice, self-sacrifice, is what love is. It is not. It is not. If your idea of, of self-sacrifice is, like, I've heard some people say that they're, they, they, you know, like, I can't, I can't be a narcissist because I, I never think of myself. Um, w one, that's not true. That's not true. Just even that, just that mindset it, it it centers one's own subjective experience as the 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 more around which all of reality their whole reality flows um because that's what narcissism is it's not selfishness it's not only thinking of yourself it's it's centering yourself often unconsciously centering yourself and your perception of the world your reality as the arbiter of reality so so yeah the idea that i can't be you know n narcissistic or, or, or selfish because i am always trying to you know sacrifice for 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 other people's happiness um okay i gotta be so bad give me just two minutes <laughs> All right, cool. Um, there is no virtue in self-sacrifice. If your, if your, if your relationship, if your your relationships and whatnot are, it's not it's not love. If you if you don't. If you only focus on in in any sort of relationship, prioritizing or uh, valuing 
one party's happiness at the expense of another's, as noble as it may seem to us on the inside. Because yeah, we've been we've been trained very well. We've been trained to associate the feeling of uh not getting what we want to 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 you know giving up what we want to be a noble thing we've been carefully trained um to 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 believe that so oftentimes in relationships when we when we make uh when we make um we make when we make concessions and are like um and, and are like I give up things if if I give up things um that I want in order to to in my mind benefit my partner and get her what she wants if you have an entire relationship built on that kind of dynamic even though you even though you are not getting what you want even though you're the one being noble and sacrificing what you want for the success of the relationship or the other person's happiness or whatever you're not acting out of love you're not doing either of you any benefit because um see that's the thing in all of your relationships you you deserve you and the people you love deserve you at your best and they deserve you and they deserve you at your best and you deserve them at their best and relationships need to 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 work to be to be healthy and and beneficial and mutual like they, they 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 have to be mutual like you sacrificing yourself um in the interest of making your partner happy over and over and over again um what you're doing by denying yourself the things your your heart desires and by constantly prioritizing another person above you and, um and you know your own what you what you want um you're hurting yourself you're harming you are limiting and constraining yourself and if your partner really loves you then they want you at your best they want you to be as fulfilled as 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 fulfilled as you can possibly be because that benefits them as well because you know i i'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to get the most out of my relationships with my relationship with somebody if like if if uh if they can't be if they can't be fulfilled and and you know follow their heart's desires if if I can't um if I can't aid them in their liberation and allow them to aid in mine then we're just doing we're just doing each other a disservice so keep that in mind sorry i i, I have like relationship advice for days um might do something might make something out of that i could probably make something out of that but but anyways selfishness is not an inherently bad thing and there's nothing noble about self-sacrifice because guess what you matter you matter and your desires and wants matter just like everybody else around you does and like sacrificing one for the other it's not it's not a relationships aren't like that Love is not additive and subtractive. Love multiplies when it is shared. It's not a resource that can be it's not a it's not a resource that can be deprived. It's Yeah. Basically, if you can't love yourself, then uh
Thanks again, Lucy. Um, if you can't love yourself, then you can't love other people. S simple as that. Loving yourself means also loving other people. All right. Let's skip around in the alphabet a little bit because uh, we don't got to be linear. Um, all right. So I'd like to... Let me see, let me see, let me see. What's a, what's a, what's a good one? Um, ah. This is a, 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 a classic. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Exactly, exactly like that. And when it comes to transition, that that's that's something that, you know, a lot of relationships that, you know, that started before one of the parties transitioned, um, their success rate is much, is much, much lower. A lot of times those relationships don't work out because, uh, you know, if you're trans and you are trying to, to liberate yourself and being like the best you can be, um, then then yeah any partner who any any partner who tries to discourage you from transitioning or from expressing your gender or anything about your identity really uh any partner who tries to discourage you from that leave them leave them <laughs> they do not have your interests at heart Okay, so jumping ahead to T is for theft. If you're watching Victoria, thank you. So, why I love shoplifting from big corporations by um, Anonymous, <laughs> featuring our friends, the mischievous soy milk and tofu. This is, is another graphic thing that we'll miss out on, but, uh, but anyways. So, why I love shoplifting from big corporations. <clears throat> Nothing compares to the feeling of elite. Nothing compares to the feeling of elation, of burdens being lifted and constraints escaped that I feel when I walk out of a corporate store with their products in my pockets. In a world where everything already belongs to someone else, where I am expected to sell my life at work in order to get the money to pay for the minimum I need to survive, where I am surrounded by forces beyond my control or comprehension that obviously are not concerned about my needs or welfare, it is a way to carve out a little piece of the world for myself, to act back upon a world that acts so much upon me. It is an entirely different sensation than the one I feel when I buy something. When I pay for something, I'm making a trade. I'm offering the money that I bought with my labor, my time, and my creativity for a product or service that the corporation wouldn't share with me under any other circumstances. In a sense, we have a relationship based on violence. We negotiate and exchange not according to our respect or concern for each other, but according to the forces that we can bring to bear on each other. Supermarkets know they can charge me a dollar for bread because I will starve if I do not buy it. They know they can't charge me four dollars because I will buy it somewhere else. So our interaction revolves around unspoken threats rather than love, and I am forced to give up something of my own to get anything from them. Uh, yeah, um, this was written in 2001, so that's what it was probably, like, I, I don't, how much, how much, how much is, is bread today? It's it probably like four four fucking dollars now oh god so we're, uh supermarkets know they can charge me a dollar for bread because i will starve if i do not buy it they know they can't charge me four dollars because i will buy it somewhere else 
So our interaction revolves around unspoken threats rather than love, and I am forced to give up something of my own to get anything from them. In a love relationship, conversely, people usually think of themselves as benefiting from giving to others, and vice versa. Everything changes when I shoplift. I'm no longer negotiating with faceless, inhuman entities that have no concern for my welfare. Instead, I'm taking what I need without giving anything up. I no longer feel like I am being forced into an exchange, and I no longer feel as if I have no control over the way the world around me dictates my life. I no longer have to worry about whether the pleasure I received from the book I purchased was equal to the two hours of labor it cost me to be able to afford it. In these and a thousand other ways, shoplifting makes me feel liberated and empowered. Let's examine what shoplifting has to offer as an alternative way of consuming. The shoplifter wins her prize by taking risks, not by exchanging a piece of her life for it. Life for her is not something that must be sold away for 7 or $8 an hour in return for survival. It is something that is hers because she takes it for herself, because she lays claim to it. In stark contrast to the law-abiding consumer, the means by which she acquires goods is, is, is as exciting as the goods themselves, and this means is also, in many ways, more praiseworthy. Shoplifting, shoplifting is a refusal of the exchange economy. It is a denial that people deserve to eat, live, and die based on how effectively they are able to exchange their labor and capital with others. It is a denial that a monetary value can be ascribed to everything, that having a piece of delicious chocolate in your mouth is worth exactly 50 cents of, of that... Or, or, Shoplifting is a refusal of the exchange economy. It is a denial that people deserve to eat, live, and die based on how effectively they are able to exchange their labor and capital with others. It is a denial that a monetary value can be ascribed to everything, that having a piece of delicious chocolate in your mouth is worth exactly 50 cents or that an hour of one person's life can really be worth $10 more than that of another person. It is a refusal to accept the capitalist system in which workers have to buy back the products of their own labor at a profit to the owners of capital, who get them coming and going. Shoplifting says no to all the objectionable features that have come to characterize the modern corporation. It is an expression of discontent with the low wages and lack of benefits that so many exploiting corporations force their employees to suffer in the name of company profits. It is a refusal to pay for low-quality products that have been designed to break or wear out soon in order to force customers to buy more. It is a refusal to fund the environmental damage that so many corporations perpetrate heartlessly in the course of manufacturing their products and building new stores. A refusal to support the corporations that run private local businesses into bankruptcy. A refusal to accept the murder of animals in the meat and dairy industries and the exploitation of migrant labor in the fruit and vegetable industries. Shoplifting makes a statement against the alienation of the modern consumer. If we're not able to find or afford any products other than these, that were made a thousand miles from us and about which we can know nothing, it asserts, then we refuse to pay for these. The shoplifter attacks the cynical mind control tactics of modern advertising. Today's commercials, billboards, even the floor layouts and product displays in stores are designed by psychologists to manipulate potential consumers into purchasing products. Corporations carry out extensive advertising campaigns to insinuate their exhortations to consumption into every mind and even work to make their products into status symbols that people from some walks of society eventually must own in order to be accorded respect. Faced with this kind of manipulation, the law-abiding consumer has two choices, either to come up with the money to purchase these products by selling his life away as a wage laborer, or go without and possibly invite public ridicule as well as private frustration. The shoplifter creates a third choice of her own. She takes the products she has been conditioned to desire without paying for them, so the corporations themselves must pay for all their propagandizing and mind control tactics. Shoplifting is the most effective form of protest against all these objectionable attributes of modern corporations because it is not merely the theoretical. It is practical. It involves action. Verbal protests can be raised to irresponsible business practices without ever having any solid effect, but shoplifting is intrinsically damaging these corporations at the same time as it, however covertly, demonstrates dissatisfaction. It is better than a boycott because not only does it cost the corporation money rather than just denying it profit, it also means that the shoplifter is still able to obtain the products, which she may need to survive. And in these days when so many corporations are interconnected and so many multinationals are involved in unacceptable activity, shoplifting is a generalized protest. It is a refusal to put any cash into the economy at all, so the shoplifter can be sure that none of her cash will ever end up in the hands of the corporations she disproves of. 
In addition, in addition to that, she'll have to work less for them as well. But what about the people in the corporations? What about their welfare? First of all, corporations are distinct from traditional private businesses in that they exist as separate financial entities from their owners. So the shoplifter is stealing from a non-human entity, not directly from the pocket of another human being. Second, since, since so many workers are paid set wages, like minimum wage, for example, that depend more on how little the corporation can get away with paying rather than on how much profit is making, the shoplifter is not really hurting most of the workforce at any given company either. The stockholders, who are almost always far richer than your average thief, are the ones who stand to lose a little if the company suffers significant losses. But realistically, no campaign of shoplifting could be intense enough to force any of the wealthy individuals who profit from these companies into poverty. Besides, modern corporations have money set aside for shoplifting losses because they anticipate them. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. These corporations are aware that there is enough dissatisfaction with them and their capitalist economy that people are going to steal from them remorselessly. In that sense, shoplifters are just playing their role in society, just like CEOs. More significantly, these corporations are cynical enough to go about their business as usual, even though they know this leaves many of their customers, and employees, ready to steal anything from them that they can. If they are willing to continue doing business in this way, even when they are aware of how many people it alienates, they should not be surprised that people continue stealing from them. And as for the myth that shoplifting br drives prices up for consumers, you don't think the prices you're paying are actually determined just by the cost of making and distributing the products, do you? Again, these corporations are charging you as much as they think they can get away with. The market, not their expenses, determines the prices. If the money they set aside for shoplifting losses doesn't get used, the owners are more likely to keep it for themselves or invest it into opening more shops, and thus running more, and thus running more independent businesses out of the market, than to share any of it with their much poorer employees, let alone pass along to, to the consumer in decreased prices. If enough products were shoplifted from a corporate store that they had to raise their prices, that would drive customers out of their clutches and into less globally harmful local shops anyway. Does that sound so bad? <coughs> <laughs> Shoplifting is more than a way to survive in the cutthroat competition of the free market and protest corporate injustices. It is also a different orientation to the world and life in general. The shoplifter makes do with an environment that has been conquered by capitalism and industry, where everything has become private property and there is no longer a natural world from which to gather resources, without accepting it or the absurd way of life it entails. She takes her life into her own hands by applying an ancient method to the problem of modern survival. She lives by urban hunting and gathering. In this way, she is able to live much as her distant ancestors did before the world was subjugated by technology, imperialism, and the irrational demands of the free market. And she can find the same challenges and rewards in her work, rewards that are lost to the rest of us today. For her, the world is as dangerous and as exciting as it was to prehistoric humanity. Every day she is in new situations, confronting new risks, living by her wits in a constantly changing environment. For the law-abiding consumer, chances are that every day at work is similar to the last one, and danger is as sorely lacking in life as meaning and purpose are. To shoplift is to affirm immediate bodily desires, such as hunger, over abstract ethics and other such ethereal constructs, most of which are left over from a deceased Christianity anyway. Shoplifting divests the commodity, and the marketplace in general, of the mythical power it seems to have to control the lives of consumers. When commodities are seized by force, they show themselves for what they are, merely resources that have been held forced by these corporations and the expense of everyone else. Shoplifting places us back in the physical world, where things are real, where things are nothing more than their physical characteristics, weight, taste, ease of acquisition, and are not invested with superstitious qualities such as market value and profit margin. It forces us to take risks and experience life firsthand again. Perhaps shoplifting alone will not be enough to overthrow industrial society or the capitalist system. But in the meantime, it is one of the best forms of protest and self-empowerment, and one of the most practical, too.
Yes. So uh, on the um on the subject of shoplifting, um it is always always okay to shoplift. Especially from corporations like like any any sort of grocery retailer or anything like ser- seriously folks if you are able to get away with shoplifting and if you're white then you you are able to get away <laughs> with it um, if you're able to do it especially in today's in in the now times groceries are fucking unaffordable and fuck the market fuck corporations fuck like you are a human being and you deserve to eat you you are entitled to food and shelter and corporations are holding that back or are, are, are holding they're holding the food and resources that you are entitled to they're holding them hostage in their in their 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 uh their their fucking retail stores and, and shit on not being brave enough to shoplift it's okay shoplifting shoplifting takes like all 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 different forms um you know most of us you know, m- most folks uh, think of it as or, uh, most of the un- uninitiated uh, think of it as um, like you know like like pocketing pocketing stuff which I mean you you can do that 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 is that is a method um, yeah that 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 is a method uh, but there's so many like small little things you can do um, I would recommend. Um, Grocery stores, big grocery stores are a good place uh, to do this. Any place that has self checkout, um, it's it's the thing because you know, like this 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 is what I do um, because yeah, probably not doing myself any favors by admitting it on screen, but yeah, I shoplift all the time. I yeah because I need food. I need food for me and my family and corporations are reporting record profits and yeah fuck that besides they're insured for that shit um but uh yeah self checkouts self checkouts um a good little practice a little practice just starting starting small start off not scanning some things like um because 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 generally all the people working at the the supermarkets and whatnot that you go to they're getting paid shit wages they're getting paid they're getting paid nothing they're getting they are are uh like it's astonishing nobody who works in the grocery stores gives a fuck um like i i have literally i have i've talked to people uh people i know who work in like safeway and and fred meyer and stuff um and walmart and the employees really do, like do not give a shit um they they will generally not and and, and again i am i am i am speaking as a white person um because the rules are different we can get away with a lot more um but the yeah and cameras cameras like old security cameras um nine times out of ten 99 times out of a hundred um generally there is nobody watching them um there there's nobody watching them uh they only really get like you know gone gone through when uh like there's been some kind of incident or something um and even then like they're not 
their their dead eyes placed around the stores to 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 stare to to stare at you and to make you feel like you're being watched um because generally you're not um and that's a, it is like the the obstacle that most people have to shoplifting is um uh the psychological the psychological aspect of it um because it it is it is a thing we 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 have been raised in condition to uh not just feel a, a moral like a moral conviction that is like oh, oh stealing is wrong um, but even when we can get past that there is still the fear of punishment and the fear of like oh like like, like if you know if 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 i get caught then you know I'm gonna be um but yeah and really trying to get past that is <clears throat> Once you're able to get over that psychological, uh, uh, you know, thing, the world becomes your oyster, and it is, yes, you are entitled to food and the things you need to survive, um, and fuck any and all corporations who, uh, keep that, keep that from us, um, Yeah, even small businesses too. If I'm being quite honest, like small business owners are some of the shittiest fucking people I've ever met. They don't pay their, they don't generally pay their uh, workers well. They are, they generally also gouge the fuck out of their prices, uh, acting like they're they're some little like you know mom and pops. You know, fuck mom and pops. Um, yeah. My homies hate. I hate the mom and pops. But yeah. Shoplifting. I heavily encourage it. Um, and. And yes. Ugh. Small business tyrants. Goddamn right. Fucking aspiring capitalists. Okay. S is for sex and space. Yes, fair. Some, some dirty stuff. Crime Think Task Force number 69. Vanguard of the Sexual Revolution. An ad hoc committee consisting of all the people at any given time who are having sex that either is broadening to their personal horizons, is socially prohibited, or takes place in a barely concealed public space. It often includes fresh young lovers, reckless life artist types, and men and women of all ages entering in un into unexpected affairs. Masturbating adolescents who live with their parents are always considered honorary members. Conquest-seeking so-called libertines are excluded on principle, of course. Here is the VSR Manifesto, composed by Nadia C. in a library night. Here is the uh, VSR Manifesto, composed by Nadia C. in a library one night where she hadn't made love for an agitating three days, or perhaps on a still Christmas morning after a night of passionate sex with a woman she had wanted for years. A call in two arms. Because because we get to have so little honest, intimate, beautifully dangerous sex that they can sell us flat images of it instead. Because we get to have so little honest, intimate, beautifully dangerous sex that they can sell us flat images of it instead. Because we spend so much more time contemplating these representations of having sex that when, that when we do sleep together, it is more a meeting of roles than of individuals. And not, su and not supportive or satisfying roles at that. Mm, okay, let me, let, me, let me start this paragraph over. Sorry. Um, 
because we get to have so little honest, intimate, beautifully dangerous sex that they can sell us flat images of it instead. Because we spend so much more time contemplating these representations than having sex that when we do sleep together, it is more a meeting of roles than individuals, and not supportive or satisfying roles at that. Because, because the most radical of us would still rather speak fancifully of total revolution than dare a moment of actual experimentation in a field that really matters, like our beds. Because as long as our own because as long as our own sexualities are constructed by the media of silence and the culture of violence, each of us is a Trojan horse bearing our own enemies, the fetishization of domination and submission, the paralysis of fear and shame, everywhere we go. It's time to stop being spectators and start being actors, or agents if you prefer, the double meaning being, the double meaning being very much intended, to take our desires back by converting our sex lives from passive recreation into active recreation. And to do this, we must first replace the representations of sex in our lives and all around us with real sex. Our numbers are greater than you think. You are one of us each time you transform public space, not by privatizing it. It is already deprived of anything personal at all, thus the irony that the public is actually the least public of spaces. But by making it into real people space, by doing something in it that truly feels liberating. For example, fucking on the roof of the police station, at the store on the rocks, just below the art museum window, etc. Not that public sex is always itself revolutionary sex, but such sex is always revolutionary in that it takes lovemaking out of the narrow confines in which it is permitted. That is, in which it is permitted to languish, caged and stripped of the spontaneity that is its life's blood, just as we languish with the rest of the world stripped of it. They shall know us by the innocence of our guilty smiles, holding hands as we walk out of the fog in parks at night, transformed and transcended, unbowed and uninhibited in this dry and dreamless world, by used birth control devices left in university classrooms and office bathrooms, by growing numbers of women who know exactly what they want and men who aren't afraid to touch one another. We will be the spark that ignites the new sexual revolution, armies of lovers laying down their responsibilities and picking up each other as weapons to fight against the smothering joylessness of this world. To quote the skinhead's anthem of homophobia and intolerance back at them, we refuse to stay in the closet because it's safe in there, precisely for that reason. And we've learned time and time again in this struggle, our only safety is in danger. Lovers of the world, unite. You have nothing to lose but your shame and a world of pleasure to win. reprinted from the ninth annual Bulletin of Saboteurs for the revolution of the erotic and the erotica of revolution. Contact Crime Think Vice Squad. Oh, uh, and uh, a note um, regarding birth control devices. Although it's worth pointing out that most of the birth control methods and devices in use in our culture today are themselves far from radical or liberating. Another aspect of the commodification of our lives in general, and sexuality in particular, is that we're supposed to buy a product for everything, even the most natural and personal of our activities, like sex. More often than not, a chemical product that fucks around with our bodies in a hundred scary ways, too. Look around and you'll see that there are alternatives. Not just to the birth control methods on the market today, but also to the traditional ways of making love and being sexual that mainstream culture offers us. All right. Space. Or uh, SS, SS for space. Alien nation. The map of despair. Space time control, space travel, and space exploration. In the modern world, control is exerted over us all... In the modern world, control is exerted over us automatically by the spaces we live and move in. We go through certain rituals in our lives, work, leisure, consumption, submission, because our world is designed for these alone. We all know malls are for shopping, offices are for working, ironically named living rooms are for watching television, and schools are for obeying teachers. All the spaces we travel in have preset meanings, and all it takes to keep us going through the same motions is to keep us moving along the same paths. It's hard to find anything to do in Walmart but look at and purchase merchandise. And, accustomed to this as we are, it's hard to conceive that there could be anything else we could do there anyway. 
Not to mention that doing anything but shopping there is pretty much illegal when you think about it. There are fewer and fewer free, undeveloped spaces left in the world where we can let our bodies and minds run free. Almost every place you can go belongs to some person or group which has already designated a meaning and prescribed use for it. Private estate, shopping district, superhighway, classroom, national park. And our very predictable routes through the world rarely take us near the free areas that do remain. These spaces, where thought and pleasure can be free in every sense, are being replaced with carefully controlled environments like Disneyland, places in which our desires are prefabricated and sold back to us at our financial and emotional expense. Giving our own meaning to the world and creating our own ways to play and act in it are fundamental parts of human life. Today, when we are never in spaces that encourage this, it should be no surprise that many of us feel desperate and unfulfilled. But because the world has so little free space left in it, and the circuitry of our everyday lives never takes us there, we're forced to go to places like Disneyland for any semblance of play and excitement at all. The real adventure of our hearts, the real adventure our hearts crave has been largely replaced by fake adventure and the thrill of creation by the drill of spectatorship. Our time is as thoroughly occupied and regulated as our space. Indeed, the subdivision of our space is a manifestation of what has already happened to our time. The entire world moves and lives according to a standardized time system designed to synchronize our movements from one side of the planet to the other. Inside this larger system, we all have our lives regimented by our work schedules and or school hours, as well as the hours that public transportation runs and businesses operate, etc. This scheduling of our lives, which begins in childhood, exerts a subtle but deep control over us all. We come to forget that the time of our lives is ultimately ours to spend as we choose, and instead think in terms of work days, lunch hours, and weekends. A truly spontaneous life is unthinkable to most of us, and so-called free time is usually just time that has been scheduled for something other than work. How often do you get to see the sunrise? How many sunny afternoon walks do you get to take? If you had the unexpected opportunity to take an exciting trip this week, could you do it? Atrocity. The city is the organization of silence and isolation, humanity paralyzed as a perpetual motion machine. Tourism. The process by which a space that has not been allocated for production or housing, i.e. the eradication of real life, is turned into a place where fake life can be had for a price. I'll, I'll reply to your comment in a minute. Let's see. A curious effect of the development of rapid transit systems is that as the distance between communities closes, the distance between individuals within these communities widens. The res these restricting environments and schedules drastically limit the vast potential of our lives. They also keep us isolated from each other. At our jobs, we spend a great deal of time doing one particular kind of labor with one particular group of people. In one set place, or at least in one set environment, for construction workers and temp employees, such, in, such limited repetitive experience gives us a very limited perspective on the world and keeps us from coming to know people from other backgrounds. Our homes isolate us further. Today, we keep ourselves locked apart in little boxes, partly out of fear of those capitalism has treated even worse than ourselves, and partly because we believe the paranoia propaganda of the companies that sell security systems. Today's suburbs are cemeteries of community, the people packed separately into boxes, just like our supermarket products, sealed for freshness. With thick walls between us and our neighbors, and our friends and families scattered across cities and nations, it's hard to have any kind of community at all let alone share community space in which people can benefit from each other's creativity. And both our homes and our jobs keep us tied down to one place, stationary, unable to travel far enough through the world except on hasty vacations. Even our travel is restricted and restricting. Our modern methods of transportation, cars, buses, subways, trains, airplanes, all keep us locked onto fixed tracks, watching the outside world go by through a screen, as if it were a particularly boring television show. Each of us lives in a personal world that consists mostly of well-known destinations. The workplace, the grocery store, a friend's apartment, the dance club. With a few links in between them, sitting in the car, standing in the subway, walking up the staircase, and little chance to encounter something unexpected or discover any new places. 
A man could travel the freeways of 10 nations without seeing anything but asphalt and gas stations as long as he stayed in his car. Locked onto our tracks, we can't imagine truly free travel, voyages of discovery that would bring us into direct contact with brand new people and things at every turn. Don't know what the expected etiquette is as far as chatting here. I don't know it either, honestly. <laughs> it's yeah, it's all very abstract to me. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just I'm just talking to talking to my computer, and sometimes people pop up with things to say. <laughs> Instead, we sit in traffic jams, surrounded by hundreds of people in the same predicament as ourselves, but separated from them by the steel cages of our cars, so they appear to us as objects in our way rather than fellow human beings. We think we are reaching more of the world with our modern transportation, but in fact we see less of it, if anything. As our transportation capabilities increase, our cities sprawl further and further across the landscape. Whenever travel distances increase, more cars are needed. More cars demand more space and thus distances increase again, and again. At this rate, highways and gas stations will one day replace everything that was worth traveling to in the first place. Everything that hasn't already been turned into a theme park or tourist attraction, that is. Some of us look at the internet, and remember, this was written in 2001, um, so hmm, a little prophetic. Some of us look at the internet as the final frontier, as a free, undeveloped space still ripe for exploring. Cyberspace may or may not offer some degree of freedom to those who can afford to use and explore it, but whatever it might offer, it offers on the condition that we check our bodies at the door. Voluntary amputation. Remember, you are a body at least as much as you are a mind. It is, is it freedom to sit, stationary, staring at glowing lights for hours without using your senses of taste, touch, or smell? Have you forgotten the sensations of wet grass or warm sand under bare feet? of eucalyptus tree or hickory smoke in your nostrils? Do you remember the scent of tomato stems? The glint of candlelight? The thrill of running, swimming, touching? Today we can turn to the internet for excitement without feeling like we've been cheated because our modern lives are so constrained and predictable that we have forgotten how joyous action and motion in the real world can be. Why settle for the very limited freedom that cyberspace can provide when there is so much more experience and sensation to be had out here in the real world? We should be running, dancing, canoeing, drinking life to the dregs, exploring new worlds. What new worlds? We must rediscover our bodies, our senses, the space around us, and then we can transform this space into a new world to which we can impart meanings of our own. To this end, we need to invent new games. Games that can take place in the conquered spaces of this world in the shopping malls and restaurants and classrooms that will break down their prescribed meanings so that we can give them new meanings in our accordance with our dreams and desires. We need games that will bring us together, out of the confinement and isolation of our private homes, and into public spaces where we can benefit from each other's company and creativity. Just as natural disasters and power outages can bring people together and be exciting for them, after all they do make for a thrilling variety in an otherwise drearily predictable world, our games will join us together in doing new and exciting things. We should have poetry painted on the walls of the shopping districts, concerts in the streets, sex in the parks and classrooms, free picnics in supermarkets, spontaneous festivals on freeways. We need to invent new conceptions of time and new modes of travel as well. Try living without a clock, without synchronizing your life with the rest of the busy, busy world. Try taking a long trip on foot or bicycle, so that you will encounter everything that you pass between your starting point and your destination firsthand, without a screen. Try exploring in your own neighborhood, looking on rooftops and around corners you never noticed before. You'd be amazed at how much adventure is hidden there waiting for you. If your heart is free, the ground you're standing on is liberated territory. Defend it. Real maps of the imaginary world imaginary maps of the real world. Our present maps describe a world no human being has ever set foot in. A world of carefully measured distances and standardized symbols, frozen in time, empty of emotional ambiences. An objective world, when today we all know that there is no world but the subjective. These maps hold so little information of real relevance to human life that it's no wonder we get so lost using them. Around and around in circles we go, arriving on time at our supposed destinations. 
with no real mm, with no with no real idea where we're bound or why let alone what there is to be found in this world beyond interstate highways and newark new jersey <laughs> even the anarchist shit on new jersey if we made our maps ourselves, plotting our individual experiences rather than the data provided by our instruments, they would reveal clearly what it is like to be a human being in this world. Perhaps then we could go about creating a world for human beings to live in, not instruments. A book like On the Road is an example of one of these maps. It charts the path of a few individuals through space and time, chronicling the traffic of their hearts as well as the motion of their bodies. Granted, it might not be much use for figuring out street directions to a gas station in Denver, but in the long run, it will help you get a lot farther than a roadmap of Colorado ever could. It's true that we all experience the world differently, and that if we make our maps sincerely, i.e. subjectively, they will all look different, but that should be cause to celebrate the breadth of the world, not to grumble. And just as a novel about people you've never met can serve as a useful map for your own life, these very individual records can often be useful for many other people, and in a variety of ways. You'll find that if you speak honestly for yourself, you're probably speaking for others as well. That's a part of being human, and our excuses for throwing around the words we so mercilessly in these pages. Here uh, follow some subjective maps that participants in our collective have made as examples. This book is itself a map too, of course, if you use it right. And this is one of the parts where I can't really re do it justice. Uh... Shit. <laughs> All right. Uh... Mm -hmm. hmm. Sex is on my list of things to work on, but I'm not there yet. I've been finding solace in being somewhat asexual, even if I don't want to be that way forever. That's uh, that's good. It's our society is we have. We're in, a, we're in a very strange place because we have, we are still a very uh, puritanical society um, that abhors sex, um, that insists on it being heavily regulated um, and controlled, but at the same time, we've commodified sex capitalism has commodified sex and sexuality to like an absurd an absurd degree like it's it's to be a sexual being in today's in today's world in the modern capitalist world generally means to to some degree to buy into the system to buy to buy products or a commodified experience or some such some such thing and so like it makes sense the 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 rise in in recent years the rise of uh the prevalence and visibility of of ace ace people like ace spec people i think that is that is a response to the commodification of the sexual revolution of the the last decade like the 2010s um because it was very much that <clears throat> i don't know how like old all all of y'all are but like i went to college in the um i went to college in the the 2010s uh from 2012 to 2016 um it was a very slutty time, uh, like, and, um, and yeah, I was, uh, I was, uh, uh I was not exempt from that, but, um, and it, it kind of reminds, it's probably kind of what the 60s felt like to the boomers, um, but, you know, you had that, that culture of free love and, uh, a kind of sexual liberation, 
that wound up being commodified by the system um and turned into just another extension of capitalism um so like uh so yeah so i understand that and okay i am i am on the ace spectrum somewhere like myself um they generally just say gray sexual because i find it to be a fun word um i uh and actually i do kind of want to do a um a, a documentary uh a, like a big study on like asexuality um and just as a phenomenon because i've noticed it is i've heard countless people uh countless aspect people talk about their experiences and the way they experience sexuality and asexuality and it's probably more diverse and varied than uh like any other sexual minority identity i've, I've ever heard like like there are asexuals who enjoy sex there are <clears throat> there are asexuals who uh who who uh you know you can be an asexual who likes sex you can be uh an asexual who is sex repulsed i, d I do think there are there there are things like that i made a whole video on sex scenes um so yeah i could check that out for my opinions on that but like asexuality is very interesting especially as it has developed as a response to it, it has it has very much developed as an identity in response to the commodification of sexuality um of the 21st century so far and as a person who as a person who identifies with this this spectrum um I am slightly bothered or not bothered concerned about the the politicization of the identity of 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 asexuality as an identity rather than a practice rather than a philosophy um a, a, a state of mind to adhere to because I, I in general I think that the queer community um the queer and trans community is far too I'm not gonna say fatalistic, but we we accept the Christians, the Christians and the 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 the, the finger waggers um, are. They tell us, "Oh, this is a lifestyle choice," and our response to them is, "No, we can't. We can't." We didn't choose to be like this. We're just we were born this way, baby. I hate that rhetoric. I hate it because, I mean, my opinion. Um, if you've watched any of my older videos, you you know this. Um, especially the thin pink line one, um, or if you've listened to my podcast, Gender Weird. But uh, I think everybody is gendered, sex non-normative. Um, and the only difference is the people who choose to embrace it and interface with it. Like, not to say that everyone's gay and trans necessarily, but interacting with and interfacing with and taking a creative role of, of self-determination in interacting with and defining and shaping one's sexuality and one's experience lived experience of sexuality like it it requires if you don't <clears throat> like nobody nobody needs to like sex because it is, it is not it's not it's not for everybody um my thing my thing is i'm i'm more I'm more bored of it than 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 anything because I 
I mean, I'm also carrying boatloads of sexual trauma um, as well, as are, I feel like, most of us in this age, especially in the age of COVID. Um, Because between college and uh, doing this YouTube thing, uh, I was... I wouldn't call it a, a form formal sex cult, but I, I was I, I was I was involved in a um a a, a, a community like that. Um, so yeah, I, I've uh, I've been around I, I've I've been around uh, a lot and had a lot of um, yeah my issues are and and i'm still i'm still recovering from the trauma of that and still figuring out my sexuality and just the 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 way it relates to my lived experience because i don't really give a shit about labels and definitions because for me if i'm if i'm into somebody if i want to have like intimacy with somebody it's usually it's due to the person and there is no there is generally no like uh, okay basically as far as sexuality goes The amount of shame I feel having sex is so bad that it is literally impossible for me to enjoy it right now because I get caught up in my expected performance and that's killed a lot of relationships. That's fair. I I, I understand that. The, <clears throat> the shame about sex and sexuality is one of the most potent po- ideological poisons that christianity has has done to us uh shame and when it comes to sexuality uh sexuality especially i think with most things um but like when it comes to our sexual desires and and whatnot shame is something we must abandon Shame is something we we need to we need to move past. Shame is we cannot be free if we are slaves to our slaves to our shame. It's it's just like overcoming shame is just like overcoming fear. You fake it till you you know fake it till you make it. You 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 emotionally emotionally you feel the shame because it's it's an emotional reflex you've been conditioned with while at the same time intellectually know that that you have nothing to be ashamed of um because yeah i mean yeah pre smart girl on the internet told you that yeah no nobody nobody should feel ashamed of their of their their sexuality so yeah just keep remind you know, keep reminding yourself of that and the, the 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 cognitive uh the the cognitive struggle between you know emotionally your conditioned emotional reflex of to shame and your intellectual part the part of you that knows better and knows that no sexuality is just it's just human activity it's 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 no different than well because like i see i see sexuality like across the board it's all performance it's all perform play and performance it is uh it is two people participating in a um in a way of performance for each other um in a way a uh a game that is um, where there's a space for creativity and uh, like, yeah, looking at all set all sex as like 
performance and play um is yeah because that's what a lot of people do is they just they take sex too seriously because we've been we've been we've been inculcated with so many um just so many of these these weird feelings about sex that we we have obsessed over we have we have we have pathologized it to a to a mind-boggling degree and the fact of the matter is that sexuality and 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 sex the the things human beings do to each other um in, in that manner are uh like just as human as fucking someone is just as natural and human as sharing a meal with them yeah so also also with regards to sexuality all fluid it's all fluid and it does not remain the same over someone's entire life so just keep that in mind before before uh, you know, before you, before you're like you, you, you declare definitively and solidly that I am, I am this or that. Literally, give it a year. You could be a different person. You're gonna like, cause you, you never know. We're we're constantly in flux and constantly changing. Um, okay, you, uh, you have a meeting to attend. Thank you so much for thank you so much for contributing um, and for 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 talking so much in the in the um, in the chat. Uh, yeah, I um yeah, I don't mind. It's nice to have some res response to bounce off of because I don't just like projecting into the void, but. Um, all right, uh, I think that's gonna be it for today. I want to read more, no, I have, I have another reading scheduled for, um, Friday, like two days from now. Um, it was, I mean, it was gonna start at, uh, I was going to start it at, um, nine in the morning, but at nine Pacific, but I actually kind of want to move it to 12. Um, so, you know, noon, give more people a chance to like, you know, show up and stuff. So yeah, that's, it's going to be happening in two days. Um, we're going to finish this, um, maybe start a little into this this is the one i'm really excited to read because this is a this is a like like a, a practical breakdown of of capitalism and how it all works um but yes before i before i leave before i leave y'all though uh a short thing i want to read real quick one second i i can't remember where i put my copy of it Uh, David Foster Wallace, um, be best known as the guy who did Infinite Jest, that that book that people are always going on about. But Infinite Jest, it seriously, it actually is that good. Just so everybody knows. Um, but uh, this is a um, it's called This Is Water. Uh, it is a commencement address he gave to a some some college group it, it was a yeah a commencement address in t 2005 and discussed widely in the wake of his death um yeah and this is this is this is a really brief like like you know 
speech and stuff, just kind of about, well, you'll see. Some thoughts delivered on a significant occasion about living a compassionate life. David Foster Wallace was invited to speak at the 2005 graduating class of Kenyon College on a subject of his choosing. It was the only such address he ever made. This is water. There are these two young... There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks at the other and goes, What the hell is water? This is a standard requirement of U.S. commencement speeches, the deployment of didactic little parable-ish stories. The story turns out to be one of the better, less bullshitty conventions of the genre. But if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise old fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The immediate point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude, but the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal, platitude, banal platitudes can have a life or death importance. Or so I wish to suggest to you on this dry and lovely morning. Of course, the main requirement of speeches like this is that I'm supposed to talk to you about your liberal arts education's meaning, to try to explain why the degree you're about to receive has actual human value instead of just a material payoff. So let's talk about the single most pervasive cliche in the commencement speech genre, which is that a liberal arts education is not so much about filling you up with knowledge as it is about, quote, teaching you how to think. If you're like me as a college student, you've never liked hearing this, and you tend to feel a bit insulted by the claim that you needed anybody to teach you how to think, since the fact that you even got admitted to a college this good seems like proof that you already know how to think. But I'm going to posit to you that the liberal arts cliché turns out to not be insulting at all, because the really significant education in thinking that we're supposed to get in a place like this isn't really about the capacity to think, but rather about the choice of what to think about. If your complete freedom of choice regarding what to think about seems too obvious to waste time talking about, I ask you to think about fish and water, and to bracket for just a few minutes your skepticism about the value of the totally obvious. Here's another didactical story. There are these two guys sitting together in a bar in the remote Alaskan wilderness. One of the guys is religious and the other is an atheist, and they're arguing about the existence of God with that special intensity that comes about after the fourth beer. And the atheist says, look, it's not like I don't have actual reasons for not believing in God. It's not like I haven't ever experimented with the whole God and prayer thing. Just last, just last month, I got caught off away from the I got caught off away from the camp in that terrible blizzard, and I couldn't see a thing, and I was totally lost, and it was 50 below, and so I did. I tried it. I fell to my knees in the snow and cried out, God, if there is a God, I'm lost in this blizzard, and I'm going to die if you don't help me. And now, in the bar, the religious guy looks at the atheist all puzzled. Well, then, you must believe now, he says. After all, here you are, alive. The, the atheist rolls his eyes like the religious guy is a total simp. No, man, all the... <laughs> This was back before simp meant, um, meant what it means today. Um, the atheist rolls his eyes like the religious guy is a total simp. No, man, all that happened was that a couple of... E mm. Sorry. Uh, a couple of Eskimos just happened to come wandering by, and they showed me the way to the camp. It's easy to run this story through a kind of standard liberal arts analysis. The exact same experience can mean two completely different things to do to different people, given those two people's different belief templates and two different ways of constructing meaning from experience. Because we prize tolerance and diversity of belief, nowhere in our liberal arts analysis do we want to claim that one guy's interpretation is true and the other guy's is false or bad. Which is fine, except we, ne we also never end up talking about just where these individual templates and beliefs come from, meaning where they come from inside the two guys. As if a person's most basic orientation toward the world and the meaning of his experience were somehow automatically hardwired, like height or shoe size, or absorbed from the culture, like language. As if how we construct meaning were not actually a matter of personal, intentional choice, of conscious decision. 
plus there's the matter of arrogance. The non-religious guy is so totally obnoxiously confident in his dismissal of the possibility that the Inuits had anything to do with his prayer for help. True, there are plenty of religious people who seem arrogantly certain of their own interpretations, too. They're probably even more repulsive than atheists, at least to most of us here, but the fact is that religious dogmatists' problem is exactly the same as the story's atheists. Arrogance, blind certainty, a closed-mindedness that's like an imprisonment so complete that the prisoner doesn't even know he's locked up. The point here is that I think this is one part of what the liberal arts mantra of teaching me how to think is really supposed to mean. To be just a little less arrogant, to have some critical awareness about myself and my, and my certainties. Because a huge percent of the stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is, it turns out, totally wrong and deluded. I have learned this the hard way, as I predict you graduates will too. Here's one example of the utter wrongness of something I tend to be automatically sure of. Everything in my own immediate experience supports the deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. We rarely think about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive, but it's pretty much the same for all of us, deep down. Remember what I said, we are narcissistic creatures. It is our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There is no experience you've had that you were not at the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is there in front of you, or behind you, or to the left or the right of you, on your TV, your monitor, or whatever. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. You get the idea. But please don't worry that I'm getting ready to preach to you about compassion and other directedness or all the so-called virtues. This is not a matter of virtue. It's a matter of my choosing to do the work of my somehow altering or getting free of my natural hardwired default setting, which is to be deeply and literally self-centered and to see and interpret everything through this lens of self. People who can adjust their natural default setting this way are often described as being, quote, well-adjusted which I suggest to you is not an accidental term. Given the academic setting here, an obvious question is how much of this work is adjusting our default setting involves actual knowledge or intellect. The answer, not surprisingly, is that it depends on what kind of knowledge we're talking about. Probably the most dangerous thing about an academic education, at least in my own case, is that it enables my tendency to over-intellectualize stuff, to get lost in abstract thinking instead of simply paying attention to what's going on in front of me instead of paying attention to what's going on inside me. As I'm sure you guys know by now, it is extremely difficult to stay alert and attentive instead of getting hypnotized by the constant monologue inside your head. What you don't yet know are the stakes of this struggle. In the 20 years since my own graduation, I have come gradually to understand these stakes and to see that the liberal arts cliche about teaching you how to think was actually shorthand for a very deep and important truth. Learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning and from experience. Because if you cannot or will not exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Yeah. This is a phrase from the 90s. Uh, you, you fucked. You're basically fucked. Think of the old cliche about the mind being an excellent servant but a terrible master. This, like many cliches, so lame and banal on the surface, actually expresses a great and terrible truth. It is not the least bit coincidental that... It is not the least bit coincidental that adults who commit suicide with firearms nearly always shoot themselves in the head. And the truth is that most of these suicides are actually dead long before they pull the trigger. And I submit that this is what the real, no-shit value of your liberal arts education is supposed to be about. How to keep from going through your comfortable, prosperous, respectable adult life, dead, unconscious, a slave to your head and to your natural default setting of being uniquely, completely, imperially alone, day in and day out. This may sound like hyperbole or abstract nonsense. So let's get concrete. 
the plain fact is that you graduating seniors had, do not yet have any clue what day in, day out really means. There happen to be whole large parts of adult American life that nobody talks about in commencement speeches. One such part involves boredom, routine, and petty frustration. The parents and older folks here will know all too well what I'm talking about. By way of example, let's say it's an average adult day and you get up in the morning, go to your challenging white collar college graduate job and you work hard for nine or 10 hours and at the end of the day, you're tired, you're stressed out and all you want is to go home and have a good supper and maybe unwind for a couple hours and then hit the rack early because you have to get up the next day and do it all again. But then you remember, there's no food at home. You haven't had time to shop this week because of your challenging job. So now after work, you have to get in your car and drive to the supermarket. It's the end of the workday and the traffic's very bad, so getting to the store takes way longer than it should. And when you finally get there, the supermarket is very crowded because of course it's the time of day when all the other people with jobs also try to squeeze in some grocery shopping. And the store is hideously fluorescently lit and infused with soul-killing Muzak or corporate pop. And it's pretty much the last place you want to be, but you can't just get in and quickly out. You have to wander all over the huge overlit stores, crowded aisles to find the stuff you want, and you have to maneuver your junky cart through all the other tired, hurried people with carts. And of course, there are also the glacially slow old people and the spacey people and the ADHD kids who all block the aisle, and you have to grit your teeth and try to be polite as you ask them to let you buy. And eventually, finally, you get all your supper supplies, except now it turns out there aren't enough checkout lanes open even though it's the end of the day rush, so the checkout line is incredibly long which is stupid and infuriating, but you can't take your fury out on the frantic lady working the register, who is overworked at a job whose daily tedium and meaninglessness surpass the imagination of any of us here at a prestigious college. But anyway, you finally get to the checkout line's front, and you pay for your food, and you wait to get your check or card authenticated by a machine, and you get told to have a nice day in the voice that is the absolute voice of death. And then you have to take your creepy, flimsy plastic bags of groceries in your cart with that one crazy wheel that pulls out maddeningly to the left all the way out through the crowded, bumpy, littery parking lot and try to load the bags into your car in such a way that everything doesn't fall out of the bags and roll around in the trunk on the way home. And then you have to drive all the way home through slow, heavy, SUV-intensive rush hour traffic, etc., etc. Everyone here has done this, of course, but it hasn't yet been part of your graduate's actual life routine, day after week after month after year. But it will be, and many more dreary, annoying, seemingly meaningless routines besides. Except that's not the point. The point is that petty, frustrating crap like this is exactly where the work of choosing comes in. Because the traffic jams and crowded aisles and long checkout lines give me time to think, and if I don't make a conscious decision of, about how to think and what to pay attention to, I'm going to be pissed and miserable every time I have to food shop because my natural default setting is that situations like this are really all about me, about my hungriness and my fatigue and my desire to just get home. And it's going to seem for all the world like everybody else is just in my way. And who the fuck are all these people anyway? And look at how repulsive most of them are and how stupid and cow-like and dead-eyed and non-human they seem here in the checkout line. Or how annoying and rude it is that people are talking loudly on cell phones in the middle of the line. And look at how deeply unfair this is. I've worked really hard all day and I'm starved and tired and I can't even get home to eat and unwind because of all these stupid goddamn people. Or, of course, if I'm in a more socially conscious liberal arts form of my default setting, I can spend time in the end of the day traffic jam being angry and disgusted at all the huge stupid lane blocking SUVs and Hummers and V12 pickup trucks burning their wasteful selfish 40 gallon tanks of gas, and I can dwell on the fact that the patriotic or religious bumper stickers always seem to be on the biggest, most disgustingly selfish vehicles driven by the ugliest, most inconsiderate and aggressive drivers who are usually talking on cell phones as they cut people off in order to get 20 stupid feet ahead in the traffic jam. And I can think about how our, children's, how our children's children will despise us for wasting all the future's fuel and probably screwing up the climate and how spoiled and stupid and selfish and disgusting we all are and how it all just sucks and so on and so forth. Look, if I choose to think this way, fine, lots of us do. Except that thinking this way tends to be so easy and automatic, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a choice. Thinking this way is my natural default setting. 
It's the automatic, unconscious way that I experience the boring, frustrating, crowded parts of adult life when I'm operating on the automatic, unconscious belief that I am the center of the world and that my immediate needs and feelings are what should determine the world's priorities. The thing is that there are obviously different ways to think about these kinds of situations. In this traffic, all these vehicles stuck and idling in my way. It's not impossible that some of these people's in SUVs have been in horrible auto accidents in the past and now find driving so traumatic that their therapist has all but ordered them to get a huge heavy SUV so they can feel safe enough to drive. Or that the Hummer that just cut me off is maybe being driven by a father whose little child is hurt or sick in the seat next to him and he's trying to rush to the hospital and he's in a way bigger, more, and he's in a way bigger, more legitimate hurry than I am. It's actually I who am in his way. Or I can choose to force myself to consider the likelihood that everyone else in the supermarket's checkout line is probably just as bored and frustrated as I am, and that some of these people actually have much harder, more tedious, or painful lives than I do overall, and so on. Again, please don't think that I'm giving you moral advice, or I'm saying you are supposed to think this way, or that anyone expects you to just automatically do it, because it's hard. It takes will and mental effort, and if you're like me, some days you won't be able to do it, or else you just flat out won't want to. But most days, if you're aware enough to give yourself a choice, you can choose to look differently at this fat, dead-eyed, over-made-up lady who just screamed at her kid in the checkout line. Maybe she's not usually like this. Maybe she's been up three straight nights holding the hand of her husband who's dying of bone cancer. Or maybe this very lady is the low-wage clerk at the motor vehicle's department who just yesterday helped your spouse resolve a nightmarish red tape solution through some small act of bureaucratic kindness. Of course, none of this is likely, but it's also not impossible. It just depends on what you want to consider. If you're automatically sure that what you know, if you're automatically sure that you know what reality is and who and what is really important, if you want to operate on your default setting, then you, like me, probably will not consider possibilities that aren't pointless and annoying. But if you've really learned how to think, how to pay attention, then you will know you have other options. It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell type situation as not only meaningful, but sacred, on fire with the same force that lit the stars, compassion, love, the subsurface unity of all things. None of that mystical stuff's necessarily true. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. This, I submit, is the freedom of real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted, you get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You decide. You get to decide what to worship. Because here's something else that's, else that's true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of god or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. On one level, on one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, bromides, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It's that they are unconscious. They're default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into, day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware if that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings, because the so-called real world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom. The freedom to all be lords of our tiny, skull-sized kingdoms, alone at the center of all creation. This kind of freedom has much to recommend it. 
but of course there are all different kinds of freedom and the kind that is most precious to you and the kind that is most precious you will not hear much talked about in the great outside world of winning and achieving and displaying the really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad petty little unsexy ways every day that is real freedom that is being taught how to think the alternative is unconsciousness the default setting the rat race the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing I know this stuff probably doesn't sound fun or breezy or grandly inspirational the way a commencement speech's central stuff should sound. What it is, so far as I can see, is the truth, with a whole lot of rhetorical bullshit paired away. Obviously, you can think of it whatever you wish, but please don't dismiss it as some finger-wagging Dr. Laura sermon. Okay, I'm, I, I'm not even old enough to get that reference. None of this is about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It's about making it to 30 or maybe even 50 without wanting to shoot yourself in the head. It's about the real value of a real education, which has nothing to do with grades or degrees and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over this is water. This is water. These Inuits may be much more than they seem. It is unimaginably hard to do this, to live consciously, adultly, day in and day out. Which means yet another cliche is true. Your education really is the job of a lifetime, and it commences now. I wish you way more than luck. Remember, no gods, no masters, all cops are bastards. Wear a mask and free Palestine. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'll see you on Friday.